I'm going to call the October 14th, 2021 meeting of the Metro Planning Commission to order. Welcome. We're glad you all are here. First order of business will be B, adoption of agenda. Do I have a motion? Second. Have a proper motion and a proper second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Motion carries. I want to take this opportunity to welcome Councilman Withers officially to the Planning Commission. We are so glad you are here and look forward to you serving with us. Item C, the approval of the September 23rd, 2021 minutes. Any questions or comments about those minutes? Seeing none, I need a motion. Second. Proper motion and a proper second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Motion carries. Council members, I saw Council Lady Gamble. Will you want to speak now or with your matter? With your matter thank you. Great, welcome. Councilman Hager, now or with your matter? Great. Thanks, Councilman. Please, anybody else snuck in in the back that you see? He asked for a deferral on items 22A, B, and C in order to get a traffic impact study. Council Lady Allen, do you want to speak now with your matter? Welcome. Yep, I'm alive. There we go. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Berkeley Allen, uh, Councilmember at large, and I thank you all for all the work that you do. I have sat in this seat and I know how hard you work, and I, I certainly appreciate it. Um, I'm here to speak on item number 18, 6103 Mountain View Road. Um, I have later obligations, so I may, may not be here when it comes up, but I do want to at least acknowledge uh, a lot of work that has gone into this project so far, and we may not be done. Uh, I'm, I'm, as I have said to neighbors and to the owners, if we need to keep working on this, um, I think we've got a good process going, and I'm willing to do that. Uh, this is a... Um, a development that was originally 114 units. Um, it began under Council Member um, Lee, and I was um, asked to help keep the conversation going, and I have communicated with her in the ways that I can under the Open Meetings Act, but um, she started with three community meetings that discussed this with the neighbors. They um, have had a number of concerns that uh, started as usual with traffic and density um, and then a number of other issues about materials and just simply um, raising the bar for what development in Antioch looks like. So as, um, as these meetings proceeded, we had, as I stepped in, we had another community meeting, two more working group meetings, and I have met with planning to talk specifically about connectivity, which I'll come back to in just a minute. Um, since the project uh, began, it has um, changed several times, some of those due to requests made by the Planning Commission and some due to requests made by the neighbors. They have reduced the number of units from 114 to 94. Uh, they have eliminated the townhomes and replaced those with single-family bungalows uh, and even added some one-story just to, to address the concerns of uh, allowing some affordability, but while also still, as I have said, raising the bar for, um, for what development in Antioch looks like. Uh, the neighbors felt very strongly that materials were important and um, the developer has agreed to, to um, put brick on half of the first phase of houses so that there can be a determination of what the market really wants. Um, 
Hardy Board would, would be what the others were. Um, there will be walking trails and benches along the open space. There's concern from the neighbors that the open space consists largely of stormwater features. There's an existing lake there, um, and there's a requirement for um, some green swales or depressions that most likely um, will not be filled with water most of the time, but the neighbors are very concerned that that is, is actually usable um, open space that serves an amenity for the neighbors, which is absolutely understandable. Um, at the request of the neighbors, um, the developers have committed to um, installing uh, amenities that make these sustainable um, issues, such as double pane windows, and again, a, a materials uh, request that they be double pane, but also be true, true divided lights, just uh, something that is uh, something that makes things look more intentional, and also that they would be installed with um, Wi-Fi and, and security doorbell capabilities as well. There has been uh, much discussion, as I said, about the green space and reducing environmental impact to an existing lake. Um, the neighbors, I believe, if, if there are some here to speak, I just walked in, so I haven't seen who's in the room yet, um, would love for more green space to be available. One possibility might be through um, getting rid of some of the roads that are there. I've had a great discussion with, with two of your wonderful staff and they have explained the importance of connectivity and that stub roads are always put in in new subdivisions so that you can tie these subdivisions together. But certainly the pattern there is in existing ones, there's a cul-de-sac and you drive into a dead end and everyone loves to live on a cul-de-sac. So this, this group is frustrated that the new stuff is now being built with connectivity in mind. So from a planning standpoint, it makes sense, but from a who's gonna live there and what is it like to live there standpoint, they really would prefer to have less pavement and less connectivity. I, I leave that to y'all to look at from a planning perspective, knowing that uh, this will come back to the council and we'll have um, a slightly different lens to look at that. Um, but I just, I do wanna convey the importance um, to the neighbors of preserving as much green space as possible. Um, and if that can be done by eliminating some of the roads, um, they would love for that consideration to be made. The developer has expressed some willingness to do that, but also pointed out that there was a request from the planning staff based on good planning principles to connect as many things as, as could be done. Um, also though, there is a possibility of narrowing the roadways from 50 feet to 46 feet, which is also good traffic calming, which was an important issue as well. So that may be a solution to that problem. Um, finally, these issues uh, are not currently written into the SP, but the owners have agreed to have a pre-construction meeting so that we could sit down at that point and talk about uh, noise, hours, dust, things like that. And, and um, again, at the council level, if we can get some of that into writing, that is an important item for the neighbors as well. Um, they have agreed to underground utilities, which I think is pretty standard in all subdivisions, and dark skies lighting, which I am excited about. Um, and um, many other issues have been discussed. So although not everything has been agreed to at this point, and, and you will hear from neighbors um, who still have concerns, and I appreciate those concerns and am committed to trying to continue to work through those as this process continues. Some of those will deal with lot size. Again, under good planning standards, this is a neighborhood evolving policy, which calls for a diversity of housing types. Um, to me, I look at a, 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 an evolving policy as going from agricultural to small single family lots seems like a great change already. Um, so, that, you know, there's some interpretation there on how small do those knots need to be. And that's, uh, that's, that's certainly an issue that I think that in the context of what other, other developments around look like, this one is clearly a diversity of housing types. Um, there are some neighbors who feel like what, what is being built there should more closely match what is already there. Uh, and again, that, that ties back into how much open space is there. So I respect that, that concern. So I think I have covered all the topics or most of the topics that have come up in the discussions that we've had thus far. I know we're not through with the process. I am grateful for all the neighbors who have shown up and given me a very specific and helpful list of what's important to them and how they would like um, for their part of Nashville to be valued um, and for the construction there to be something that says we are an important part of Nashville. I also appreciate um, 
that the developer has made some substantive changes. Um, I know they would love to say that we're done. I don't, I don't think we're quite done. Um, and I will continue to work through the council process with this. I expect that at some point there will be at least one more deferral to continue to work on this, whether that needs to happen here from a development standpoint um, or planning standpoint or at the council level. Um, I, will, I will commit to continuing to work on ironing out some issues that are still outstanding. So with that, I just ask for your careful consideration, take into account that work has been done. Um, if you feel like we're there, I'll, I'll trust you on that one. But I do, I do think it's important to know that there are some good planning principles that, um, that, that are at, at pretty strong odds with what is um, just neighborhood desire for, for our neighborhood to be, continue to be a great place to live. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Council Lady. Council Lady Van Reese, you want to speak now or with your matter? Council Lady Toombs, now or with your matter? Now. Go right ahead. Welcome. Thank you, and um, good afternoon, um, commissioners. Uh, a couple of my items are on, um, de will be deferred, so I won't speak to those 9 and 16. But I do have 19, 20A, and B, 25, 30, and 31. Um, 19 is a, a, Curtis, a development on Curtis Street. It's a fairly large um, development. Um, it's on about a little under 32 acres, 300 multifamily residential units. It's actually a diversity of, of housing options. There will be flats, townhomes, single family homes. Uh, so it, it really fits in, in what my desire has been for the district in order to, in, in terms of having a diversity of housing options. Um, there was concern from constituents regarding the conservation area and displacing the animals. And the bulk of the, the property is still gonna be conservation. There's been some discussion back and forth about preserving trees, uh, putting in trailheads and connecting that to public space that will be usable by the public, uh, perhaps working with Metro Parks to make it a public park. Uh, so I think there's been a lot of good conversation. It, it results in um, connectivity, which is also an issue in, in my district. Um, the developer has been open to working with the community as far as traffic calming measures are concerned. So I, I, I'm in support of the de development at this point. Uh, the next one is 20A and B. Um, generally in the same area, this is Summit Avenue. Uh, again, uh, there's a lot of connectivity that comes with this particular project that does fit within the land use policy of, of the area. It's uh, multifamily, it's, it's a townhome development. Um, there has been some conversation with constituents and I'm sure there'll be some ongoing conversations as well. And this developer too has been open to doing some traffic calming measures because there's concern about there's certain streets such as Curtis Street um, that have become a cut through and people are very concerned about traffic in that area. Uh, so I am in support of this project. Um, 25 is, is a small project, 2304 Lloyd Avenue. Um, there hasn't been a community meeting for, and I will say for those previous projects, there have been community meetings. Uh, there hasn't been a community meeting for 2304 Lloyd Avenue, but there will be um, before it gets to the council public hearing. I don't have any issues with this particular project. Um, 30 is 2106 24th Avenue North, same thing. There will be a community meeting before it gets to public hearing at council. I, I don't have any particular objection to this project at this time, so I'll, I'll defer to your expertise. In 31, I, I think there is, it's recommended for disapproval by uh, planning staff. And I think there may be some confusion on the part of the developer. What they're wanting to do is, it's two townhomes, but built in a way where someone could operate a business outside out of their house. Um, and with recent council legislation, home-based businesses are okay. Um, so I think that the current zoning, the R8 zoning that they have is probably appropriate and they don't need to, to rezone. Um, so I will defer to your expertise on that one as well. And that is all I have in front of you today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Let me also take a reminder that we do have, uh, we are under a mask mandate order in the building. So if everyone would put their mask on, we would very much appreciate it. At least any other council people snuck in on us. Very good. I'm a resident in that area that you're speaking with. You'll be allowed to speak when the matter comes up. Um, all right, we are now on to item E, items for deferral withdrawal. Lisa? 
Um, Chairman, I just wanted to note that we did receive a request from Councilman Hager to move items 22A, B, and C um, from the consent to the deferral. And so would now be an appropriate time to uh, maybe ask the commission if there's an objection, and if not, um, sure. have uh, Lisa read those into the record as deferrals. Lisa, did you have any comments you wanted for us on those cases? Okay. Any objections, commissioners? So we'll move 22 A, B, and C to the deferral withdrawal list. Lisa? The following items are for deferral or withdrawal. Item number 1A, 2007 SP 037002. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. The associated case 1B, 95P025007. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. On page four of your agenda, item number two, 2018 SP 009003. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting. Item number three, 2021 SP 057001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting. Item number four, 2021 SP 063001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number five, 2021 SP 067001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number six, 2021 SP 068001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting. Item number seven, 2021 SP 073001. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number eight, and these are on page five. Item number eight, 2021 SP 075001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number nine, 2021 SP 077001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting. Item number 10, 2021 Z077PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting. Item number 11, 2021 Z092PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting. And I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 12 on page 6 of your agenda, 2021 s 183 Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number 13, 2021 CP 007003. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting. Item number 14A, 2021 SP 009001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting. Item 14B, 7874P003. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting. Item number 15, 2021Z, 070PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item number 16 on page 7 of your agenda, 2009 SP 017003. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 17, 2017 SP 091003. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 28th meeting, and I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. On page eight of your agenda, item number 22A, 2021 SP 062001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. Item 22B, 12384P001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. And 22C, 4586P003, staff recommendation is to defer to the November 18th meeting. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 33, 2021Z103PR001, staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. I think that's it. All right, first I need to recuse myself on items 14A and 14B. Let me read this list back to you, Lisa. Items for deferral withdrawal, item 1A, 1B, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14A, 14B, 15, 16, 17, 
22 A, B, and C, and number 33. Is that correct? Yes. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral withdrawal. Any questions? Or otherwise, I need a motion. I make motion to accept deferral items. You need a second? Commissioner Henley? We have a proper motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Motion carries. All right, on to item F, consent agenda items. Lisa? As noticed to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. I will now read through the item numbers that are listed as tentatively on consent. If you are opposed to an item that I read, please raise your hand. If you raise your hand, it will be presented when we get to that item on the agenda. Item number 18, 2021 SP. Okay, item 18 will be presented. Item number 19, 2021 SP 041001, Curtis property. Are you? Like if anyone's opposed to that item. Right. Item 20A, 2021 SP 046001, Summit View. Is there anyone opposed to that item? Item 21, 2021 SP 060001, 1300 Hunters Lane. Is there anyone opposed to item 21? Item number 23, 2021 SP 066001, 401E Williams Avenue. Is there anyone opposed to item 23? Item 24, 2021 SP 069001, 121 Hart Lane. Is there anyone opposed to item 24? Item number 25, 2021 SP 074001, 2304 Lloyd Avenue. Is there anyone opposed to item number 25? Item number 26, 2021Z, 059PR, 001, a rezoning on East Trinity Lane. Is there anyone opposed to item number 26? Item number 27, 2021Z086PR001, a rezoning on Glencliff Road. Is there anyone opposed to item number 27? Item number 28, 2021Z097PR001, a rezoning on Little Green Street. Is there anyone opposed to item 28? Item number 29, 2021Z098PR001, a rezoning request on Little Green Street. Is there anyone opposed to item number 29? Item number 30, 2021Z099PR001, a rezoning request on 24th Avenue North. Is there anyone opposed to item number 30? Item number 32, 2021Z101PR001, a rezoning request on Perimeter Court. Is there anyone opposed to item number 32? Item number 34, 2021Z, 104PR, 001, a rezoning on Maxwell Road. Is there anyone opposed to item number 34? Item number 35, 174P, 014, Hickory Hollow Pud cancellation. Is there anyone opposed to item number 35? Item number 36, 2009 UD001018, Downtown Donaldson UDO modification. Is there anyone opposed to item number 36? Item number 37, 2021M007SR001, a street renaming request. Is there anyone opposed to item number 37? 
Item number 38, 2021S-174001, Pleasant Cove Concept Plan. Is there anyone opposed to item number 38? Item number 39, 2021S-175001, Eastland Subdivision. Is there anyone opposed to item number 39? And item number 40, 2021S-185001, Selma Avenue. Is there anyone opposed to item number 40? Okay, uh, Chair, I will now read through with the um, captions. Okay. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. The following items are on the consent agenda. On page eight of your agenda, item number 21, 2021 SP 060001, 1300 Hunters Lane, it's a request to rezone from R20 to SP for property located on Hunter's Lane to permit 69 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page nine of your agenda, item number 23, 2021 SP 0660001, 401E Williams Avenue. It's a request to rezone from R10 to SP for properties located on Williams Avenue to permit 32 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 24, 2021 SP 061001, 121 Hart Lane. It's a request to rezone from RS10 to SP for property located on Hart Lane to permit 26 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 25, 2021 SP 074001, 2304 Lloyd Avenue. It's a request to rezone from R10 to SP, zoning for properties located on Lloyd Avenue to permit five multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 26, 2021Z 059PR001. It's a request to rezone from IR to MULANS for properties located on East Trinity Lane and Ambrose Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve, and I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 28, 2021Z097PR001. It's a request to rezone from IWD to MUNA for property located on Little Green Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 29, 2021Z098PR001. It's a request to rezone from IWD to MUNA for property located on Little Green Street. A staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 30, 2021Z099PR001. It's a request to rezone from CS to OR20 for property located on 24th Avenue North. A staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 32, 2021Z101PR001. It's a request to rezone from SP to IWD for property located on Perimeter Court. Staff recommendation is to approve. On page 11 of your agenda, item number 34, 2021Z104 PR001. It's a request to rezone from AR2A to RS10 for property located on Maxwell Road. Staff recommendation is to approve, and I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 35, 174P014, Hickory Hollow PUD cancellation. It's a request to cancel a portion of the Hickory Hollow, Hickory Hollow planned unit development. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 36, 2009 UD 001018, downtown Donaldson UDO. It's a request to modify the downtown Donaldson UDO for property located on Cliffdale, Cliffdale Road to permit a modification to landscape buffer standards. 
staff recommendation is to approve the front yard setback building orientation and landscape buffer yard modifications with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 38, 2021 S174001, Pleasant Cove concept plan. Staff recommendation, I'm sorry, it's a request for a concept plan approval to create 22 lots with five duplex lots for property located on Pleasant Hill Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. On page 12 of your agenda, item number 39, 2021S175001, Eastland Subdivision. It's a request for final plat approval to create three lots on Eastland Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 40, 2021S185001, Selma Avenue. It's a request for concept plan approval to create five lots on property located on Selma Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Under other business, item number 41, an employee contract renewal for Joni Williams. Item number 42, adoption of the 2022 Planning Commission calendar. And item number 46, to accept the director's report. Thank you. Let me read these back to make sure we've got these. Items for consent, 21, 23, 24, 25, 26, 28, 29, 30, 32, 34, 35, 36, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, and 46. That's correct. Commissioners, you've heard the items on the consent agenda. Any questions or comments? I need a motion. I make motion to approve consent agenda with associated conditions. You need a second? Dr. Sim seconds. That's a proper motion and a proper second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. So by my math, Lisa, if you'll correct me, we are going to hear six cases, items 18, 19, 20, 27, 31, and 37. Is that correct? And 22. No, 22 got deferred. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, my markings have gotten confusing over here. Okay. Um, yes, 18, 19, 20, 27, 31, 31, 37. And 37. Yes, and did I, I wanted to make sure that I had noted item 33 for deferral. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. All right, if, uh, if your matter was deferred or on the consent agenda, you're welcome to leave at this point in time. Otherwise, we will hear these six matters. And we are up for case number 18. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Patrick Napier. I'll be presenting item 18, 6103 Mountain View Road, SP. This is a request to rezone um, to specific plan uh, to permit 94 single family lots. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The subject property is outlined in blue on the screen. Um, it contains a total of 22.18 acres and is located at the corner of Mount View Road and Hamilton Church Road on the northeast corner. The site is currently zoned R8 and AR2A. AR2A requires a minimum lot size of two acres and is intended for uses that generally occur in rural areas. R8 permits one and two family uses with a minimum lot size of 8,000 square feet. The policy for the site is T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving and Conservation. The evolving policy is intended to create and enhance residential neighborhoods with more housing choices and improve connectivity, um, along with moderate density development patterns. 
Conservation policy is intended to preserve environmentally sensitive land features through protection and remediation. The SP proposes 94 single family residential lots. The plan proposes two lot types, a traditional single family and a bungalow. The bungalow lot type is also single family, but slightly smaller with more narrow setbacks. The primary point of access is provided from Mount View Road. Maple Timber Drive, an existing stub street to the north of this site will be extended into the site. This was intended when Maple Timber Drive was platted with the neighborhood to the north. The new, new stub streets will also be provided to the east and west property lines. The bungalow units will front Mount View Road, internal open space, and private streets. All bungalow lots will be accessed via private drive. All of the single family lots will be accessed by new public streets. Parking will be provided in compliance with Metro code for all units. The SP incorporates architectural standards such as material commitments offered by the developer and added amenities for each lot. Sidewalks which meet the requirements of the major and collector street plan are shown along the frontages of Mount View Road and Hamilton Church Road. All new public streets internal to the site, which are local streets, will contain sidewalks which meet local street standards. The T3 neighborhood evolving policy is a residential policy intended to create and enhance suburban neighborhoods with more housing choice and improved connectivity. The SP includes two residential dwelling types, which will contribute to the diversity of the housing choice in the area, and therefore, staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Thank you, Patrick. The applicant will have 10 minutes. If you'll please come up and state your name and address. Good afternoon. Uh, Baylin Dahl with Meritage Homes, 9424 Ashford Place, uh, Brentwood, Tennessee. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you gentlemen and ladies uh, this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> as Patrick mentioned, this property is just over 22 acres, uh, currently undeveloped. There's one residential home on the site I believe was built in the early 50s. Uh, the site does have a 1.4 acre pond and three separate wetland areas totaling 0.43 acres. 25 foot buffers are included in the pond and wetland areas uh, on our site plan. The owners have indicated that the wetland areas were created by, cre by grading activity that their family conducted as part of part of their use of the property. The proposed plan for the project has evolved over the past year based on input from staff, from comments received at numerous community meetings uh, that the, the developer, uh, Meritage Homes, has been a part of. Previous plans have had as, as many as 114 units and include a mixture of single family lots and townhomes. The current plan contains 46 single family lots with an average lot size of 5,500 feet and 48 bungalow lots that average 3,380 square feet. Uh, they front on open space and are served by rear-loaded garages uh, off of the private streets. Uh, these proposed home sizes will help to increase the price point options for residents and buyers of this area. Over 35% of the site is open space, and this does not include the areas set aside for detention ponds. The public road network has been designed to provide connectivity to adjacent properties per the guidelines of the Antioch Pre-Slate Community Plan and the current planning practices of Metro. The streets were also laid out to minimize the impact on the wetlands and buffer areas. We have worked with planning, stormwater, and NDOT to develop a layout that limits the impact of wetland and buffer area, maintains hydrologic connectivity between the pond and the wetlands, and provides both vehicular and pedestrian connectivity. We received preliminary approval from the Stormwater Management Committee for the proposed design, which includes mitigation at a two to one ratio and a boardwalk style pedestrian system in the impacted areas instead of a concrete sidewalk. Both the public and private streets will have sidewalks on both sides, and the sidewalks will, will add to both Mount View Road and Hamilton Church along the property's frontage. The developer has voluntarily made additional commitments for the proposed development based on community input. These include landscape buffers along the northern and western property lines adjacent to the existing residential developments. Uh, the first 12 homes that we construct, six shall be brick and six shall be cementitious uh, siding hardy board with a brick water table along the bottom. A ranch style home will be offered on the front, <clears throat> on the front loaded single family lots. Homes will include double paned windows, a ring style video doorbell and be pre-wired for internet. A pre-blast survey will be completed prior to the blasting activity on the site. Uh, entry monumentation and landscaping shall be provided along Mount View Road. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Uh, we've also agreed to contribute $50,000 toward the intersection improvements at Mount View Road and Hamilton Church Road. Um, we have read the staff report in the associate conditions and have no objections. Uh, we ask for your support and are happy to address any comments you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. You will have two minutes left for rebuttal. Okay. I'll ask now for those people in support to please come up and speak. All right, seeing none, anybody in opposition? Please come up and speak. Come right on up. You are, come right ahead. You're, you get to go first. Good evening. My name is Sheila Hayes. I am the listing agent for the property, but I'm also a member of the Burgess family. So thank you for allowing us to speak. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we did a lot of homework on the front end before we decided to list the property. We met with Stormwater, we met with two different civil engineers, we read over the Nashville Next Initiative to make sure that the buyer that came forward would have in mind the same vision for the property that Nashville would accept. So we have been told that we didn't care what happened with the property and I just wanted to let them know that that is not true. So we've had probably six community meetings. We have gone back and forth with the community and heard all of their requests. Um, I believe that Balin has made a very good effort to, to meet most of those requests and the ones that were reasonable. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know that <clears throat> we do appreciate everyone that's heard, you know, what we've proposed. And we do feel like this will be an asset to the community. It fits with everything else that's being constructed around it. We're not putting a lesser than project in the area. Um, it, it very closely matches everything that is designed for the area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now for the opposition, come on up. Please state your name and address and you'll be given two minutes. Hi, thank you for letting us speak today. My name is Diane Polnitz and this is my husband, Daryl Polnitz. Darryl Polnitz. And we've been living at our property um, for 14 years. We live at 3420 Maple Timber Drive. Um, and I am definitely here in oppose of the project. I will say that I am pleased with some of the developments that the developer has made. But at this point, I don't feel, and I can safely speak for our community, that we're not at the place where we can say we're ready to move forward. Um, I've talked to several people in the community, actually didn't know this meeting was taking place. There was no signs to say it was on this date at this time. But I'm here and I just want to make sure I represent our community as well as I can. Um, when we moved to our property, one of the things that attracted us to the property is the quietness of the street and the view that we had. It's, it's surrounded by several trees, um, really nice wildlife. I actually brought a picture to, to show you today. Um, and I know that there's a lot of things that the neighbors have concerns about. My main things are the buffer zone as well as um, the connectivity to Maple Timber Drive. Uh, the reason why I do not want it, Maple Timber Drive to be connected to the development is, first of all, I don't see the reason. On Maple Timber Drive, when you come up Maple Timber Drive, there's currently 13 homes that are adjacent to the street. Um, there's a dead end on the right hand side and then you drive up and there's another dead end. So the only thing you can do at Maple Timber Drive is make a left onto Lake Town Drive and then after that you make a left on Oak Timber Drive and you go to Hamilton Church Road, which is on the perimeter of this property. It's right adjacent to Mount View Roads. And you can also make a right, but that's just neighborhoods. So unless 94 pe people moving into this development for 94 homes, know the people in our neighborhood, to me, there's no reason to connect the road. Um, and I think actually the developer originally said that he didn't want the road connected as well. Um, and so that's my major thing. Can I say one other thing? I'm sorry. Very quickly. Okay. On the buffer zone, they laid out that they would uh, put a hundred Every 100 feet, they will put a canopy tree, and I think we need some more clarity in that. I prefer that the perimeter of the property be of a C grade or higher intensity because 
I don't, I mean, I think we need clarification. Is it a lateral buffer or is it a buffer from the end of our property to the new property? Perfect. And that's all that I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. So do you want to, do you want to speak as well? No, she can. Sounds like my <laughs> sounds like my marriage. All right. Thank you. All right, the applicant will be given two minutes for rebuttal if you'd like. Uh, I'm going to say something that I'd like uh, Sean Acosta to say something as well. Um, with regard to the buffers, we're at uh, 20 feet to 37 feet along that north side. Uh, from the back of our property line to uh, of a house line to the actual property line in addition to the distance from the northern property line to the next house So we've got a pretty big swath of land there. Uh, we will as required do the canopy trees uh, some underbrush uh, But there will be a, a buffer there between property lines um, The connectivity uh, That's something that um, you know, I think is out of out of my realm um, you know, we're Open to suggestions, but this was based on on planning staff and the metro's desire to have roads connected. Um, I will let uh, Sean speak with the uh, buffer requirements and as uh, what the vegetation will be. Sean DeCastro with CSDG. Uh, so, with regard to the buffer, the the, the uh, developer has committed to doing a, an additional buffer above and beyond what is required along the northern and western property lines where uh, the, pro the project abuts existing residential uh, that has been added to uh, the SP that you have and we're calling for 4.5 canopy trees 1.8 understory trees and 18 shrubs every 100 feet in those areas thank you so much so I will de declare the public hearing closed and we will debate this matter Mr. Henley I will start with you thank you commissioner um, my first comment is one that I think probably should be given a little bit more clarity um, and that is the connectivity piece um, I've, I've had several conversations with developers that are discussing connectivity and with this site having multiple adjacent sites that um, are planned for connectivity is there any discussion about how where when um, having connectivity to every single potential street has come up I'm just curious if that's been part of the discussion uh, sure, and I'm going to ask Patrick um, to go to an, an additional slide that shows the broader um, the broader overall connectivity of the area. Yeah. So, um, and do you have the major and collector street plan where it shows planned future connections? Maybe not. Um, so let me just talk a little bit. So when we're looking at overall connectivity and we're looking at um, the existing stub street that stubs into this property, um, this is a relatively well connected area. If you look, you can see that subdivisions have they've, have they've come through. There are cul-de-sacs, but there is also a relatively well connected um, uh, network of, of local streets and collector streets. And so when we look at this property and we're looking at connectivity, we're wanting to sort of continue that well-connected series and network of local streets. Um, otherwise, uh, yes, we do have the possibility of potentially connecting this property to properties to the west and east in the future, but we're losing some of the connectivity to the north that currently exists through all of the existing subdivisions. And so we wouldn't want this to sort of be created as potted off and not connected to the rest. And when we're thinking about the connection, we're also not just thinking about it from sort of a good planning practice. We're thinking about it from a transportation, not just cars, but bicyclists, people walking, being able to go from one development to another without having to go on to a major road. Um, and so those are some of the reasons that we would look at connectivity. And so we, we felt like as, as staff that we would always be encouraging and our subdivision regulations and zoning are going to, and Nashville Next are going to encourage that connectivity. We did set up the future to the east and the west. Maybe one of those is is not necessary, but we thought that the one to the existing step to the north was important. Commissioner, the only other thing I would add, the two standards typically are mobility, as Lisa mentioned, but then also fire safety. Mm -hmm. And a challenge there is, is how do you calculate risk, right? And you're looking both at 
current subdivisions and then future. We have a history in this city of anticipating future connectivity and imagining that that will meet the fire safety standards, but you're, you're imagining a future condition that hasn't been, been built yet. And so that is one of the important questions and we do get advice from the fire marshal's office from a life safety perspective on where we use those connections. I, I appreciate that insight. I'll, I'll hold until I hear further conversation from commissioners, but I, I appreciate that. Um, one more statement I'll say is just the, the connectivity. I know there's been some conversations more about having greenways that are more neighborhood um, circuits. Um, fire safety, of course, would trump that proof comment that I was planning to make, but I think that's something that we also put on the table when we're, when we're having these conversations is just because it's not a street doesn't mean there, cannot, there shouldn't be any type of perceived or conceived connectivity. Dr. Sims? Um, I'm actually kind of excited about this, not necessarily because of the layout, but because it's been so many people involved in trying to make this decision and under great leadership with Berkeley and her commitment to go ahead and keep working with the neighborhood. Um, I know this is a place that needs to have density and it looks like it follows it. The two things that keep coming up, particularly in the mail um, about this area was the a buffer and um, the continuation of this discussion, which Berkeley has agreed to do, and you've addressed the buffers and the greenery, so I'm, I'm okay with this. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, Lucy, just so I can follow up your um, comments regarding fire safety perspective, and also Lisa's comments regarding maybe all of the connectivity doesn't need to be included, um, but some of it will be required. I think I heard you say that, uh, or advisable for future connectivity. So when, when the fire folks have reviewed this, were there, I'm assuming that their recommendations were for all the connectivity that's being proposed to be included, is that right? Can you speak to the fire? Sure. sure. So for a development of this size, um, there would need to be two uh, connection points. And so they are exceeding. And I've, we've got the plan back up on the screen. Um, what I was mentioning was if during the, we do feel like the northern connection is very important. Um, if during the ongo ongoing discussions, there is talk of eliminating either the stub to the west or the stub to the east that we've set up for future connectivity, that I think one of those could probably be eliminated if that was an ability to increase some open space or, um, I, and I don't think that that would not change our recommendation nor fires because they're already meeting the, the number of connections that are needed. But, but Lisa, I agree with Lisa's assessment. I think what happens when you start to limit connections is when future projects come in and you're having to assess that risk, the, those projects may or may not have access to meet fire safety standards in the same way. And this is how we develop by subdivision. And so you're always having to balance those options. So the, the fire marshal will look at subsequent developments. And if we do cut off one from the West, for example, <coughs> there will be more limited access and, and safety for those neighborhoods, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I was really empathetic to what the neighbor was saying about the connectivity piece, um, especially after Lisa said that perhaps some could be lost. But I mean, the point is well taken that in the future, you would like to be able to meet those fire safety um, requirements. And you don't know if you'll be able to meet them or not when you uh, have made a decision in the past to cut off some of those options. So. Um, that makes sense. I do have a question regarding, um, and this is, I'm glad that the neighbors did know that the meeting was happening and, and attended, but just the question about notice and signs and just how those things are done to make sure that people know about the meeting. Sure, um, the planning department prepares um, a list of neighbors that must be notified within a certain radius um, and those notices are prepared by the applicant brought to the planning department. We actually put them in the mail so that we can ensure that they have been mailed. Um, so we make them bring us stamped envelopes and we put them in the mail based on our list. Um, and then signs must also be posted on the property, um, likely along Mountain View Road in this case. Um, and we get a um, documentation from the applicant that those signs have been posted appropriately. Okay, that's helpful. We obviously want 
people attending so that we um, can hear their comments um, and make better planning decisions. So my last question is, and it relates to something that um, Council Lady Allen was talking about, and I don't, I really would like to just understand how that um, fits in with the fire safety um, concern. So obviously some of the concerns would be when you're adding road or connectivity, um, just the speed at which cars are moving through. And perhaps I think what Council Lady Allen was saying that if you decrease the size of the roads that that would um, encourage slower traffic. What, how would that, I'm assuming that that would be fine from a fire safety perspective, the width that she had suggested, but just questioning because I know those trucks are big. So I have uh, conversed with NDOT. Um, we're currently <laughs> showing a 50 foot right of way for our local streets. That can be reduced to a 46 foot right of way to reduce overall impervious surface. Um, that would not allow for on-street parking uh, with that uh, cross-section, so just something to be aware of, but it is um, something that we can support in a cross-section of right away. Okay, that, that um, is helpful. It's nice to have the option to have on-street parking, so perhaps, <laughs> I don't know if the pros would necessarily outweigh the, uh, or the cons would outweigh the pros in there, but um, thank you for that, it's helpful. Councilman Withers. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm really excited about this um, this SP. Uh, we know that there is uh, so much growth that is occurring in the southeast quadrant of the county. It's already a fairly dense quadrant of the county, but there is so much growth uh, and demand for new housing there. And sometimes the community uh, in southeast has expressed to council a lot of frustration, particularly sometimes with, uh, with rentals and apartment buildings and things like that. Um, and so I think it's great to be able to add some additional single family homes uh, in the area since we, that's one of the things we hear a lot on council is that folks wanna have more single family homes in Southeast rather than the multifamily buildings, which are also fine, I think. But uh, I th so I think that's a real asset to this uh, proposal. Um, I appreciate the uh, presenter mentioning the connectivity piece, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit, uh, particularly through the wetlands. I think the presenter mentioned that there would be sort of a boardwalk style sidewalk, which is one of the things that I have been concerned about, like when you get to this point, are you just walking in the street? Uh, but I think that, that that boardwalk solution on those sensitive wetlands is, is a really good solution. It's something we're trying to do more of in places like Shelby Park and some of our parks to, to make sure that we're not adding concrete if we don't have to and not uh, disturbing uh, the soil if we don't have to. And I think that's a really innovative solution. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask about um, a little bit. Actually, it does pertain to those private streets. I'm assuming that they do have sidewalks, um, uh, but um, just wanted to uh, sort of make sure of that, but also see how that factors in with potentially narrowing the street. Um, sometimes what happens if you have a narrow street uh, is people park on the sidewalk, and of course it's not something that Metro can factor in, but that uh, behavior uh, of the way that people respond to that sometimes is, uh, is unfortunate. So um, I don't know that having a narrower street is necessarily good or bad, it could be, but uh, one of the things I hope to see in more of these uh, developments is that we do maintain the connectivity. I do think the connectivity to Maple Timber Drive is, is vital. I also think that the connectivity point to Mount View Road is also vital, particularly because this plan is gonna trigger so many uh, investments in upgrading the road there for future connectivity. So I think the point to the east, the connection point is, is really vital as well. Um, I do think connectivity is important and hopefully as, as we get new developments that are constructed, the, uh, the builders can work with NDOT and the council members to go ahead and factor in just whatever kinds of traffic calming is important. Could be speed tables or whatever, but uh, we hear so much demand for that uh, on the council that we just can't fund it. And even with adding more staff, we're barely, barely chipping away at it. And I think the more we can build connectivity into our street grid network, um, but also go ahead and incorporate that traffic calming while it's being done, I think that provides the connectivity that we need, but also provides some degree of comfort to the neighbors that they won't have be experiencing quite the amount of speed that they were. Um, one other thing I wanted to discuss, uh, just put out there, I don't know that I need an answer to this, and I know that Councilmember <coughs> Allen will do an outstanding job of this, but we always uh, hear uh, at council about, uh, we often hear about lives, uh, wildlife, 
Um, it's uh, a reality that uh, in established suburban neighborhoods, like some of the ones in East Nashville, when those neighborhoods were constructed, wildlife was disturbed and the wildlife has returned. Um, so sometimes that uh, is uh, wildlife reasserts itself, I, I guess I will just say. Um, so I, I do get that concern, but we can't necessarily stop all development just because the, the next subdivision over might disturb wildlife when one's own house being constructed also did that. Um, but one thing that we also hear a lot about in the community is trees. And um, I don't know that we need to go to the level of having the Planning Commission uh, dictate trees per se, but, but I know that that is a concern. We hear that in the community, particularly sometimes with new, new housing construction or infill housing construction. You know, someone pulls a permit for an infill house, it's supposed to have maybe two trees in the yard. When the house is constructed, it may not be a good time to plant the tree or things like that, but just uh, encourage uh, the uh, presenting uh, team uh, and council member Allen to really give a lot of thought to trees. We do have a, an urban forester who reviews a lot of this, and we do have some trees that are uh, already on list that are uh, more desirable than others. But uh, just encourage the, the applicants to continue working with council member Allen on that. I think there are always opportunities to really specialize uh, trees that are good for that particular area or the different lot sizes with their, the canopy size that they will get to. Um, but just encourage folks to keep working on that. But otherwise, I think this is a pretty good plan, and um, I'm excited to see those conversations that have already happened uh, get to this point and to see what will continue to happen until this gets through finalization at council. So thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair Haynes. Um, I think uh, when I saw this plan, my uh, first uh, concern was transition from existing neighborhood to this SP, and especially extension of uh, Maple Timber Drive. But I am uh, pleased to hear there is a 20-foot buffer, because that was uh, my biggest concern, because without that buffer, it would be like a really abrupt change. So I'm pleased to hear a uh, developer committed to a uh, good transition. So that's a, a plus. And I do understand neighborhood, your existing neighborhood standpoint. They don't want to connect existing drive to new uh, subdivision, uh, new project, especially uh, 94 uh, additional neighbor. But in this specific location, I think to connect this street is really important, not only to give uh, access to, safe access to new project, but I think it will give little uh, traffic relief to existing neighborhood as well. So I think this uh, connection is very important. I would like to ask one thing, uh, Lisa. I think, you know, if this connection was somehow amended at the council, uh, at that point, does it become the disapproved bill? A, a change of that level, yes. I think that that would, that would likely be viewed in that, in that way. So, Lisa, if, the, if there was a sense of the commission that they wanted to offer some flexibility, that could be put into the record. I'm not offering, I'm waiting to hear what you have to say, but if, if there was a sense to say something like um, approve with a modification of the row down to X, the commission, you could accept either one. I think we could enter something like that into the record and, and make it clear that that would not trigger a disapproval. If, right, that yeah, was, if that was your direction. Yeah, I think uh, decreasing the right-of-way, we would see as minor, um, but I think uh, eliminating the connection would be viewed as, as um, not minor. Right. Yeah, that's where I'm coming from, because uh, to me, as a planning commissioner, the connectivity in this particular street is very important considering safety, because otherwise there's only one way in and one way out. And this, you know, 94 housing for that is just a bit too much, and I'm really worried about fire and safety. So for that, I really would like to encourage uh, council member to keep that connectivity. And if you know, uh, that was removed, I really don't want to even, don't want council to even consider. I, I really feel strongly about this connectivity for the safety purpose. But as far as narrowing, I think it would be good to increase uh, green space and slowing the traffic, and that, uh, that flexibility is, uh, I, I can support that. And so, 
All in all, I think this is a great transition and considering uh, this specific location. So I am in support. If nobody else have any additional comment, I would like to uh, move to approve with the staff condition. That is a proper motion. Do I see a second? Mr. Henley's has a second. Any other questions or debate? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We are on to item number 19. I'm Dustin Shane, staff planner. This is item 19, Curtis Property SP. This is a request to rezone from R10 to SP zoning for 300 multifamily units on about 32 acres. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Zoning on the property right now is R10, which is for one and two family uh, dwelling units uh, with a minimum lot size of 10,000 square feet. The policies on the side are T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving and Conservation. Here's an aerial of the site where you can see most of that conservation policy is covering the uh, heavily wooded steep slopes on the north end. Uh, this is uh, just a look at the development broken down into three zones, which we'll go into uh, here in just a minute. So as I said, this is for 300 multifamily units at a density of about nine and a half units an acre. Uh, it's for flats, townhomes, and cottages. There's going to be garage and surface parking uh, provided throughout. The height will be greatest down towards Clarksville Pike at four stories and 60 feet, and will step down as you get internal to the site. Um, there'll be sidewalks and open space throughout with a good level of pedestrian connectivity. It will have access to Clarksville Pike through a mixed-use SP, which is approved in 2020. Uh, that's now entering the final site plan submittal phase. Um, it will also connect the Curtis Street to the south and possibly other streets that um, will require uh, development of adjacent um, parcels there. But we are conditioning it to have at least two of these connection points before final site plan approval. So the zone, zone one is about 200 townhomes and, and or flats. With, it's a, they're leaving that open to have a different mixture based on the, the market. Uh, zone two is going to be 100 cottages, and zone three, just 10 townhomes and cottages. There will be buffering provided north and south uh, per code to buffer those against those single family uses. And zone three is going to have a trailhead and primitive trail uh, two that will connect to the White's Creek Greenway. Um, we got community input on this that um, there was a great desire for the public to have access to those steep wooded slopes and to the Greenway. Uh, along White's Creek. So we drafted a memo that should be before you um, that shows we are conditioning this first to hopefully be part of Metro Parks if that if that works. Uh, if that doesn't work, then to have it at least be publicly accessible and to remain undisturbed. So this is consistent with the policies on, uh, that are governing the site. It's preserving most of the steep slopes. It's creating publicly accessible green space. Um, it's providing more housing choice, uh, greater connectivity, both vehicular and pedestrian, um, to Clarksville Pike and to the rest of the neighborhood. And as I said, it's going to enhance access to the existing White's Creek Greenway. So staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. The applicant will have 10 minutes. Please state your name and address. Okay. And I'd like to hold two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, name is Ben Muskelly with ESP and Associates, 500 Wilson Pike Circle, Brentwood, Tennessee. Um, first of all, thank you, for commissioners, for your time today. Um, this project, as Dustin said, is located right off of Curtis Street. Um, it's kind of hard to know where this is, but if you remember a year and a half ago, there was a large SP on Clarksville Pike. This is basically the second phase of that. 
Um, this project steps down in density the closer you get to Clarksville Pike. We had flats and townhomes. As you get into the neighborhood, we transition down to townhomes and then to cottages. We truly want to build those as cottages. I know sometimes that cottage word gets thrown around and it ends up being a giant three-story building. That's not what these are. Um, these are small scale. We like this site because it does create a transition into the neighborhood. We like it because it does improve connectivity. Um, Curtis Street dead ends into the site. The SP to the south or on Clarksville Pike, it dead ends into the site. So this is kind of creating this finishing of framework for the neighborhood. With this, we tried to create green space throughout the development uh, in exception to the uh, preserved steep slopes. We're gonna preserve that area. We are comfortable putting that in a, a conservation easement. We're comfortable putting that in a restriction deed or we're comfortable donating it to Metro Parks. Um, however, that land needs to be transferred over is fine with us. But we also wanted to create green space in our development for people to use. Um, we also like this development because it creates formal connections to White's Creek Greenway. Right now, the site has uh, some primitive trails that have been cut through it by people that aren't the property owner. We don't really know how they got there, but people are using the site, and we would like to see that kind of cleaned up and made safer and better for the community. Um, this site, we, we like it. We think it's a great site. Uh, we encourage continued conversation with parks and would hold any time for rebuttal. Thank you, sir. Anyone in support of the project, please come up. Seeing none, anybody in opposition? Come right up, sir. Please state your name and address, and you'll be given two minutes. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, of course, I don't babble. My name is John Babcock. I live at 2210 Summit, or 2207 Summit. Um, it is a nice property. It, there's so many wildlife. Uh, I'm sure uh, the aviar is, uh, they enjoy coming home and having these steep slopes. Uh, we have rabbits, squirrels, just going crazy there. I mean, it's just being in town and you have all this wonderful nature in my backyard. Um, what is also being built right off of cliff is another 97 um, unit complex. And then on up the hill is now they're looking at another 100, whereas you have these houses built in the 1930s, nice, cute, solid houses that are going to be mowed over because you have uh, complexes, complexes, now this huge 30-acre uh, that's going to be leveled uh, that's going to just keep on eating these older houses without any anything grandfathered in to having a single family home with a with land so it's all going to be tall three or four tall skinny houses you see them in germantown you know how how that's all cramped together and basically it'd be nice to know more about what kind of development they're going to do uh before it's continued anything else and Perfect. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Applicant, you'll be given two minutes for rebuttal, please, sir. Thank you. Um, we we do not, I know tall skinnies is a concern. These, our single family homes here are two-story cottages. They're small. This site has one home on it now. Um, it's in pretty rough shape. Uh, some outbuildings. There's nothing here that is a massive leveling. We're planning on making this tiered. We've preserved the steep slope since the beginning. That's been number one narrative of the site for us is to stay out of that conservation area and develop a site that kind of works with the land. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Seeing no more discussion, I'll close the public hearing. Commissioner Johnson, I'll start with you. Thank you, Chair Haynes. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, What's the group? Nashville Tree Conservation Corps. I mean, they did a really great job and, you know, provide us a really great uh, knowledge and, you know, make our job <laughs> a little bit easier for this, you know, input. And I am so happy to hear uh, the added con condition uh, because I was concerned about uh, trailhead and a parking lot. And it seems like this uh, newest 
uh, Metro Park Trailhead Agreement is a little bit shifted, so the parking lot and trailhead is uh, right next to each other. That's what I'm saying. That's right. It would shift it. And um, the condition is written in such a way that, that, that we want them to continue the conversations mm -hmm. with Metro Parks, but should it not lead to it being public park land, that there be still public accessibility through recorded easements. Thank you. So to me, this is a great uh, example of while conserving great area and you know sensitive uh, hillside, but added you know appropriate density where it's appropriate. So uh, I really appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness of this uh, uh, project, and I am in agreement with staff recommendation. Councilman Withers. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. This is another one that I'm uh, pretty excited about. I did read uh, some of the comments on this one that came through, and of course, uh, many of the tree advocates live on my own constituents. So that's uh, great to have that expertise that uh, they share with me and others a lot. Um, and I think it, it is helpful in this case. One other thing, too, is you know, I just haven't been to this area of town in a while. And so yesterday, I uh, took a field trip uh, and went down the, the streets and uh, uh, there is a lot of change that's happening on those streets. They are pretty narrow streets as they are. We do have new development that's going on, uh, quote unquote, tall and skinny houses being built in that area. And even uh, when I was there, there was a gentleman getting out of an Uber going to what appears to be an Airbnb in that area. And so there, there is a lot of change where folks are sort of discovering that area that maybe most people who didn't live in that community wouldn't have, have gone there uh, previously. Um, there, one other thing that I did as well, and, and I'm sure that Commissioner Haynes could really speak to this, but uh, I reached out to Metro Parks to get the parks staff's uh, input uh, about this, uh, and that was very helpful and detailed, and I can talk about that a little bit more. One of the things, I, I guess, I know there's a lot of discussion right now about sort of putting a parking lot up here at a trailhead, and I would like to offer maybe a, a, a counter to that a little bit, which is that... Um, we, uh, uh, one of the questions that I would have is like, who is responsible for maintaining that if that were there? Is it the HOA's responsibility or who would be responsible for maintaining sort of a public parking lot if that were to be the case? Um, I know for the Shelby Bottoms Greenway, which is uh, in District 6, there are, obviously there's the Nature Center, there are some trailheads that do have parking lots. There are also some stub streets. Uh, that go to a, a trailhead connection that don't have parking lots. And in fact, those neighbors really kind of don't want their little street to become uh, a, a traffic center or a, a major parking lot. So I, I think it's important to have public access to things, but not always necessary to have a parking lot at a trailhead. Um, one thing that sort of furthers my thinking about that is that, you know, I also went down to uh, Hartman Park, which is adjacent to this. Plenty of parking at there, uh, at the trailhead there. Uh, and this site, when you walk along the, the greenway, um, maybe took me 15 minutes at a leisurely stroll to get to this location. So I don't know that uh, adding an additional parking lot at the top of this hill, I mean, it, it could be done, it could be a good idea. I don't know that it's really that essential to uh, having public access to this land, um, and because I do think that the existing um, uh, Hartman Park trailhead uh, is close by and is sufficient. It is already maintained by parks. Uh, and I just kind of worry about redundancy as well. I think the neighbors who live on the street, and I'm not saying that this trail would be a, a huge parking lot per se, but those streets are pretty narrow getting, getting in and out of there, and we are introducing a large number of new houses. And so, um, again, I, I just don't know that sort of creating this parking lot at a re relatively obscure location as a destination point for folks wanting to access the park is, is a good idea necessarily. I mean, it could be done. But I find that there is good accessibility to the site. Uh, and it, I think the gentleman mentioned that folks are sort of using this already. Uh, there's good accessibility to the site already from the existing Hartman Park trailhead in, in my view. So I don't see that particular piece as being essential or necessarily desirable. Um, from Metro Parks' standpoint, <coughs> Um, they, uh, this has, it, it seems to me, based on my communication with uh, park staff, that they would require, there, there is already a, a, a greenway easement for the greenway connection that is there. I think the, the conservation easement would be up to 75 feet. It sounds like to me what the, the community is looking for is to put a conservation easement over this whole parcel 
uh, that, that is in, you know, it's not just a 75 foot, but over all of it. I do think that that is a good idea to help ensure that the, uh, the woodlands are preserved and the steep slopes. Um, you know, sometimes we do have property owners that go out and start removing trees. I mean, that just happens if we don't have that in place. And so I can see, and I would, I think that that conservation easement covering that whole portion of the parcel is more important for protecting a more or less a, a public asset um, than the, uh, than having a, a parked trailhead connection at this location. So I, I, I do think that that is something that maybe we would want to consider. However, at this time, you know, Metro Parks has not uh, agreed to accept the land if it's donated necessarily or uh, come to a point of having a plan for maintaining it. Um, one concern, and I, and I do know that this is sort of describing a primitive trail, but that's one of the things I asked staff about is if this were uh, formalized into a trail as part of the park system, what would that involve? And of course, if it were to be paved, which it's not, but if it were to be paved, um, that would involve pretty significant removal of uh, trees and habitat, and there would be requirements that even though you're navigating these slopes, that uh, any kind of a paved trailhead would have to meet ADA compliance standards, which would be difficult to do. So that is a, a, another reason for keeping it a primitive trailhead, which is discussed. But again, for me, I don't know that we need to be creating uh, a requirement for a parking lot to intentionally increase the number of people using that primitive trailhead because even as we find in such as Shelby Bottoms, which is in District 6, um, just the foot traffic even on a primitive trail does uh, damage the natural habitat. So it, it's fine, I think, that, that it has an access point, particularly from the Greenwood Trailhead, but I just don't know that we need to generate traffic where people are intentionally going there to, to traverse that. I think that ends up being sort of counter to some of the conservationist principles that are here. And I think it also probably further exacerbates concerns that maybe neighbors would have about increasing traffic on streets that are pretty narrow. Um, so I just wanted to add that thought uh, to all of that. But it's a great site. I'm really excited to see uh, this, you know, again, adding some housing uh, in an area of town that's very, very close to town, certainly very close to Clarksville Pike. Um, I uh, look forward to hopefully having the uh, SP next door uh, also built out so that we do have that additional connection to Clarksville Pike. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in council about folks kind of wanting additional retail and addi additional services on Clarksville Pike. Uh, and so in order to support that, you have to have more rooftops. And having these additional rooftops in this location that uh, that is accessible to Clarksville Pike, I think, furthers that overall community goal of getting uh, the rooftops that are needed to support additional retail and services on Clarksville Pike without sort of overburdening the, the community. So just wanted to offer those comments about the, the green space preservation in particular. But other than that, I, I think this is a great plan. And again, I uh, appreciate the, the applicants uh, working on that and look forward to uh, further communications between the applicants, the council member, and Metro Parks and the Parks Board. So thank you. Mr. Blackshear. Um, I agree with Councilman Withers' points about the um, the conservation area. Maybe encouraging folks to use it um, is could not possibly um, be the best idea. Maybe just leaving it as undisturbed as you can um, might be more helpful and might um, help allay the concerns that the neighbor voiced. Um, you know, uh, I live in this area of town, and I know we've heard tons of people. Um, in East Nashville and some folks in Antioch talk about this too, but when we think about neighborhood evolving areas, um, we think about the word evolution being something slightly gradual and not radical. And so I know here we're going from potentially at best 171 units to now, um, I guess it's 300 that are gonna be there. and. Um, the neighbor mentioned some other uh, developments that are happening. And if you've driven this area often, which I do, there's tons of stuff going on over there. And so I would like for us as a commission just to be thoughtful when we hear those concerns of neighbors, and we've heard it a ton in East Nashville, to just really think about that. What does the word evolving mean? And are we seeing evolving changes? Are we seeing something that is going to look dramatically different, um, not literally overnight, but maybe over the span of a year. And so that's not what neighborhood evolving means to me. I don't think that's what the word evolving means.
issues in general. Um, so I would just like for the commission to be thoughtful about that. Thank you. Dr. Sims. Um, I want to thank, I really like this idea so often when we think about cottages and you said that we get this idea, but I think so often we in a, unintentionally actually gentrify a neighborhood by not purposefully putting in these kinds of housing where people could stay and afford to stay. Um, as people know uh, all too well is um, I really believe in listening to our neighbors and to our neighborhoods and there were three conditions that uh, the large um, the Trinity Lane Coalition which is made up of a lot of different organizations actually wrote to us and this this particular organization represents a lot of people in the neighborhood so and it talks about adding something to the uh, condition 12, which would like to see them amended to include the entire steeply sloped uh, forested northern area in this easement. This would ensure the public area. I don't know if that's something that we can talk about. I actually do believe um, we need a parking space. Parks are being loved to death, and we know that that's just statistically out there. Um, and so if we don't provide some type of park, and they're going to end up parking in the few places, and this is a this is a crowded kind of, of area. I mean, I think it's, it's a beautiful design, but I do think listening to our neighbors, they know best about what they really want. So I, I actually do think they need a, some type of designated parking for this area. And they would like to include, include um, the forested north, northern area. So I don't know how we all come to agreement on that, but those are the two things I would really particularly like to see in terms of trusting our neighbors to know what they want and need. Commissioner Hanley? Uh, well, a lot of things that have been said by my fellow commissioners, they resonate with me. One of the things that, that definitely did stand out um, was just from the aerial view and hopefully the intention and in what's delivered is the diversity of offerings in the space. Um, I'm, I'm going to continue to be a champion for, for density and I say incremental density and I think Commissioner Blackshear's comments resonate with me as well. You know, a lot of the changes and the densification is, is seen as radical to a lot of our a lot of our neighbors. Um, and, but I think here you have a, a really good opportunity to strike a balance and to put a lot of the a, a lot of the areas that um, have a lot of natural beauty. Um, it sounds like the the team that was presenting here today recognized that they're extremely flexible in terms of what that ultimately becomes. And so, I think you know. Dr. Sims said it, you know, listening to the neighbors, I mean, if that's an area, if it's an asset to the community, um, having someone who's stewarding it um, to ultimately deliver what the community wants, I think is really important. I also think um, it's, a, it's a really good opportunity for more and more people to have um, adjacency to natural space that's conserved. I wish I would, we would get that in front of us a lot more, right? You know, you, you step up a lot of density, but also you carve out an area and it is intended to be conserved for, um, forevermore, hopefully. Um, and so I, I really like the plan. I think bringing the intensity of, of the site further away from the neighbors, I think, is something that's just responsive to um, either what those particular neighbors wanted or just, you know, the city as a whole is, is kind of said. And so for, for me, knowing that we need a lot of the housing that's being proposed, um, this makes a lot of sense to me. And again, um, Councilmember Withers hit the nail right on the head. Having done a lot of work in that community, there is a lot of desire for more um, commercial and retail amenities. And, and as they begin to densify, the community um, will likely be rewarded, hopefully be rewarded. And so I think as we have greater um, numbers of, of residents as well as infrastructure to support that, um, hopefully this area will have a great balance of both vibrancy from the economic space as well as now some champions for conservation. And so to me, this is, again, a really good balance. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Lisa, um, can you address Commissioner Sims' question about the memo and whether how we communicated that with mm -hmm. some of the neighborhood groups that she mentioned, just for the record? Certainly. So um, I know the applicant as well as staff had been working with some of the um, interested community groups throughout this process, um, and we had added um, three additional conditions that are on a memo. Um, and did you, oh, did you, oh no, I thought we handed them all, I'm apo apologies. And, and Commissioner Sims, the memo should be viewed as part of your staff yes. report. So if you're voting on the, thank you, Lisa, explain. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I'm good. so sorry. I'm sorry, I thought we'd gotten everyone. Um, 
No, no, that's okay. It's good for it to be explained in the public anyway. But um, when we came up with these conditions, we did touch base back with the Haynes Trinity Group to make sure that they were uh, in agreement with these conditions, and they were. Um, and so being able to explain that is very helpful. When the motion, if there is a motion made, um, it should be um, with the, uh, to approve with conditions, disapprove without all, with the additional conditions as noted on the memo. Perfect. Thank Great. You. Yep. Dr. Sands, does that answer your questions? Yes, absolutely. Can I keep, keep this? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Any other questions? Seeing none, I will need a motion. I was going to say, um, now that that's been addressed, and I, I think it was best done publicly as well, I'd like to make a motion um, to accept staff's recommendation with the additional amended memo to the staff's recommendation. That, that's a proper motion and a proper second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We are now on to item 20. Chairman, forgive me for interrupting. Um, it's my understanding that there's an item on a, the agenda, a mandatory referral pertaining to a street renaming. The commission has a fairly limited role in this, and it's uh, my understanding that the council member has been able to work with some of the folks who had a concern about the street renaming. And so if you would be willing to entertain um, a motion to put that back Go ahead. If we'd be willing to ask if, if indeed there are no other folks here to speak on the street renaming, then the commission might entertain a move to place that on consent. Very Does good. that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Okay. Are there any other people in the audience the here item. to speak on item number 37? And, and the councilwoman is here, uh, Council Lady Van Rees, um, who can also speak to that if necessary. So but. seeing none, commissioners, are you all okay with moving this to the consent agenda? I will need a motion. Yes, I make a motion to add item number 37 to consent agenda item. And we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item number 37 is back on consent. Thank you, Council Lady Van Rees. All right, we're now on to item 20A and 20B. We'll hear, hear those and then vote on them separately. Hello, my name is Jason Swaggart, and I'll be presenting item 20A and 20B. These two items will be presented together. However, each item will need to be voted on separately, uh, beginning with item 20A. 20A is a request to rezone the subject site to SP. And item 20B is a request to cancel a planned unit development overlay that applies to the site. The site is outlined in red and consists of three properties. Clarksville Pike is approximately 750 feet west of the site, and Buena Vista Pike is approximately 800 feet to the south. The total land area is approximately 15 acres. The larger property is vacant. There's a cell tower on the smaller western property, and a single-family home is located on the smaller property to the east. Overall, the site is mostly wooded. The site also contains areas with steep slopes. Staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions for item 20A and approval for, of 20B if the commission approves 20A. If 20A is not approved, then staff recommends disapproval of 20B. The existing zoning is one and two family residential. Under the existing zoning, a maximum of 100. Oh, I'm off. Thanks. Um, under the existing zoning, a maximum of 101 residential units is possible. Under the ex uh, this would include 81 single-family lots and up to 20 duplex lots. The site is also within a planned unit development that was approved in the late 70s. Records for the planned unit development are, are limited, but it is understood that it only permits the existing cell tower. <coughs> Where did it go? Oh, this is the planned unit development. All right. This is the proposed specific plan. The plan includes 112 attached residential units. Units front either a public street or open space. Access into the site is provided from a new public road connecting to West Summit Avenue at two points forming a loop. Private drives provide vehicular access to all units and no unit has direct vehicular access to a public street. All of the units include garage parking. The plan also includes surface and bicycle parking. The plan includes a small park as well as a footpath through the woods. The site includes a sample building elevation. The height and the SP is limited to 45 feet. 
The site is within the Bordeaux Whites Creek Haynes Trinity Community Plan. Two policies apply to the site, suburban neighborhood evolving and conservation. The evolving policy is intended to provide opportunities for housing diversity, street and pedestrian connectivity. The conservation policy is intended to protect environmentally sensitive areas, and in this case, it recognizes the steep slopes on the site. Staff finds that the proposed SP is consistent with the evolving and conservation policies. The plans provide for a an alternative housing option from the mostly single family area that surrounds the site. Given the site's proximity to Clarksville Pike, which is a major commercial corridor, the slight increase in density can support service, services located and planned along Clarksville Pike. Consistent with the conservation policy, the majority of the development footprint is outside the areas with the steepest slopes. Keeping in mind that each item must be voted on separately, staff recommends approval of item 20A with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Staff recommends approval of 20B, but only if the commission approves 20A. If the commission does not approve 20A, then staff recommends disapproval of 20B. Thank you, Jason. Is the applicant here? Please come on up. You'll be given 10 minutes. Please state your name and address. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Josh Rowland. I'm with Kimley Horn. We're at 214 Oceanside Drive. I'm representing the applicant today. I'd like to reserve two minutes for a rebuttal, please. Um, we're a close neighbor to the previous SP, just on the other side. Um, we connect off of Summit Avenue, which is a, a street that abuts uh, Curtis Drive as well. Uh, we appreciate the help that staff has provided in working through uh, some of the roadway connectivity issues associated with this site. And we appreciate uh, Councilwoman Toombs' uh, participation and her um, help getting us to her community meetings and just the outreach that we've experienced throughout this process. Um, <clears throat> our site has quite a bit of conservation area as well. We have some steep slopes, and it actually creates for a pretty unique and um, nice condition where these townhomes can be tucked in and around existing slopes and trees. Um, Today, Summit Avenue comes from Clarksville Pike, and it also comes from Curtis Avenue, but it's disconnected today. There's a dead-end condition right kind of mid-site on our property. Um, that's This uh, road improvement on Summit Avenue is one of a couple of other uh, projects that this uh, development will bring to the community. We'll connect Summit Avenue through, improve that road, widen it, provide sidewalks along our property frontage, uh, NDOT has also requested that we improve Cliff Drive, which um, actually comes and tees to our eastern intersection, uh, widen Cliff Drive so that it has the minimum 20-foot wide pavement section. Um, so by providing connectivity and some road improvements, there's some good uh, overall improvements to the neighborhood and allowing options for uh, residents to get out to both Clarksville Pike and Trinity Lane that they don't currently have today. Um, as I mentioned, we have, you know, in upwards of 40% open space on this project, about five acres of that are conservation areas and steep slopes where the trees will be maintained. <clears throat> the townhomes uh, are offered uh, with two and three bedroom options, so that'll create a couple of different price points uh, within this development, creating some diversity apart from the single family homes that are currently in large part what is seen in the neighborhood. Uh, we do agree with all conditions that staff has requested. Um, we respectfully request your approval today, and we're here to answer any other questions that come up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You'll be given two minutes for rebuttal. Is there anyone in the audience we can, wishing to speak in support of the project? Seeing none, anybody w willing to speak in opposition to the project? If you all please come up, state your name and address. You'll be given two minutes each. Thank you so much for attending. <clears throat> Good evening, commissioners. My name is Kenneth Warren. I live on Summit Avenue. I've been there about 20 years. I got other relatives, I mean, uh, neighbors that's been there 30, 40, and 50 years. It's a very quiet neighborhood. It's got a view of downtown, and we know everyone is coming after it. So we, I oppose the road for the simple reason, it's a small road, 
we have to park, when we have company, we have to have people parking on our road and come down to our houses. And when they decide to make that road all the way through, it's going to be a lot of traffic. And it's going to bring crime in the area. And also the development. They're already developing behind us. And 24 hours of banging, banging, banging. You know, I don't oppose to new development coming in the area. But as far as using that street, I think we're going to have a problem with the water pressure once they put all of those units up there. I think it's going to be more crime coming into the area because of the view. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much for attending. Yes, sir. Please state your name and address, and you'll be given two minutes. My name, uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, my name is Keith Binion. I live at 2105 Summit Avenue, and I've been a resident for over 30 years, and glad to have had the peace and quiet that we had so far. Looks like it's about to change. My opposition is only related to the amount of traffic that will come to the intersection at Summit Avenue and Clarksville Highway, which is already a difficult intersection to na navigate in the mornings and afternoons. Uh, if you're heading to town, it's very difficult to get onto Clarksville Highway going south. Uh, the other things I think we talked with the uh, engineering firm th this week, and we've pretty much agreed that he has a trailway that will be accessible for the public, which I don't have a problem with. The routing of the road, as I look at it now, it's going to create a problem for the existing residents, which are few, but we, we still would like to keep our access to the road as far as in front of our houses, where we're not worried about cars coming off the hill and maybe hitting the cars that are parked in the street. Um, that's pretty much what I have today. Thank you so much. Anyone else willing to speak in opposition? Yes, sir, come on up. My name is James Horton. I live at 2152 Summit Avenue. And on one end of my property, it's Cliff, when you come up from Cliff on Summit, my property ends where the summit begins on both sides. Now, if they put summit all the way through, my property from the entrance where they're going back to the developing would be right in front of my house. From one diagram I seen would be right in front of my doorway. And I, I would say about five yards from my door. Someone missed the turn would run right through my house. And, you know, and it wouldn't be a good thing for uh, interest to the developer right in front of my house. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Applicant, you'll be given two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add that um, with the improvements to Summit, we are widening the pavement. Uh, on the north side, we'll have curb and sidewalk. I think that will provide better and safer opportunities for parking on the street. Um, we did complete a traffic study with this project. Uh, it included requirements to provide additional signage at Clarksville Pike and Striping, as well as uh, at the bottom of Cliff Drive. Um, by connecting Summit through, it does provide residents in the neighborhood opportunities to access Trinity Lane and Clarksville Pike uh, from a second location than they currently have for those living on the west side of, of Trinity, or excuse me, of uh, Summit Lane today. Um, so I think um, while change is difficult at times, um, there are some great benefits to the community at large here that these uh, roadway improvements will provide. Thanks. Thank you. I will declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Blackshaw, I will start with you. Well, here we are again in District 2. Um, so 
what the neighbor said about the configuration of the development, um, I'm trying to get into my mind and on the, the plan how that works. So um, the developer said that there's going to be widening of roads and infrastructure improvements, but what the neighbor says, basically the entrance right now is going to be in front of his house. I mean, is that when you have looked at the plan, is that how it's set up? So right now, Summit Drive um, does not continue through. There's public right-of-way, but it's not improved. It, it ends. And um, when this development first came to us, um, they actually were not proposing to connect, and they were able to acquire additional property because we indicated that it would be really important to be able to... Oh, time myself. Um, we, we indicated that it would be really important to make that connection of Summit at least to Cliff. Um, and so, yes, I do believe that where the new uh, public street looping through um, would be near the, this, the gentleman's home. Um, but there is existing right-of-way on Summit, which is where the improvements would be made. Okay. So uh, I'm trying to make sure that we are addressing his safety concerns. Um, what I'm hearing, and maybe is there a better um, picture of it just so that we can see it? Is there another slide? Just so I can better visualize it. I just want to make sure that we're addressing the concerns because obviously um, we want to make sure that anything that is going in is respectful of the neighbors who are already there. I, I don't think that there is anything um, additional. Um, I don't, and, I, and the way that this projects, we don't have the ability to sort of point at things on the screen either. Can you? Are you wanting to see something with more existing conditions on the ground? Yeah, that okay. yeah, exactly. that aerial. Yeah, there. would that is that helpful? Let's see. So you can see where there is right of way of summit, but it is not built. There are some private driveways um, starting at around. You can see parcel O nine five around that places where it starts to taper off and it's not actually built to public standard, but there's public right-of-way existing. Mm -hmm. um, and so this development would be improving West Summit on their side with curb and gutter and sidewalks and widening, but there would not be curb and gutter and sidewalks installed on the south side. They would only be improving the, their, their, the northern side of um, West Summit on the development side. Okay. And so what, what you, we're talking about the widening of the road. So we're going from what to what? So there's actually no public road um, at all built in portions of Summit. And so it will be building a 20-foot section 20. then with um, curb and gutter and sidewalk. Um, and it would be making sure that in other places along with on Cliff Drive that it would be a 20-foot pavement section. Some of the other neighbors just talked about, and I know this is something that we hear all the time, um, but making sure that the um, that the improvements are actually an improvement to the existing neighbors. So we're talking about the infrastructure improvements in the roads. And I'm, I hear what you're saying about the conversation that you had with the developer and making sure there's a connection. And I'm, I'm guessing, I know that when you're looking at this, you're always respectful of the, um, the existing neighborhoods. I'm assuming that the way that it has been done and the way that it has been configured, in your opinion, is the best way to do it to maintain, one, the integrity of the neighborhood and also allow the best options for the getting in and getting out of the area. Right, that, that's correct. I mean, we're, we're always balancing, of course, the existing residents with um, new proposals and considering Nashville Next, um, over half of this property is designated as a tier one center by Nashville Next. Um, Clarksville Pike is identified as an immediate need uh, transit corridor. And so providing for that connectivity um, for people to be able to get to transit and those sorts of things. And so we're always balancing between the current residents um, utilizing the existing right of way that's there, shifting the improvements as much as possible onto the new property um, and, and balancing out those, you know, Nashville next and, and what was adopted through that. Commissioner, I, I think you're right anytime. And we see this on occasion you have, that you have homes built on unbuilt right of way and we're 
you know, taking steps to provide public upgrades. I think it, it's very fair to ask to make sure that those upgrades meet the needs of the current property owners. So I really appreciate that. And whatever decision is made with the commission today, um, you know, I think the council member was here earlier speaking to community discussions, but I think having the developer sit down with the current property owners with you know, the road plans and showing exactly how wide those are going to be, maybe marking off on the property so that they can see exactly where that improvement will be can sometimes better help us visualize. So that might be something to consider um, as opposed to just looking at something on paper or on a screen, really having them go out and look house to house with where that improved road might be could be something to address your your comment here. Yes, and I mean, obviously, I'm the commissioner and um, I live in the area, but this is not my neighborhood. So if that conversation hasn't happened with the neighbors, that'd be really helpful because obviously they're going to know best about one, what possibly could happen. He's obviously concerned about the safety of it all. And then if you've already addressed that and thought about it, when you're thinking about the, the plans for the road, that'd be nice to communicate. Councilman Withers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I believe I'm kind of with Commissioner Blackshear that um, even having been through the area, because Summit doesn't go through when I did my field trip out there, that that wasn't a portion of the area that I was able to uh, explore. But um, I do th for the area that almost sort of shows that some of the streets are going going to be where a person has a driveway at the moment. It sort of looks like an aerial, if I'm not mistaken. So I think working with those affected property owners is going to be of paramount importance just to make sure that uh, it, that folks aren't greatly inconvenienced and no longer able to access their house because uh, a street has been put through that. So, so I, I think that that's really important. One other thing, too, that I've been trying to um, get just get myself acclimated to it as well, since this is the second one in the same areas. Um, do I understand, so Summit Avenue would more or less connect all the way over to Curtis Street, is that correct? If this is built out or not? Is there still an unbuilt portion? That's correct, it'll just go to Cliff. Just to Cliff, okay. That, 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 that's helpful because one of the things I was saying is that you know, with the other development for Curtis Street, you know, we have these other requirements and why, why don't we have similar requirements for this one since it's a similar number, but that's helpful since they don't at least connect yet at this point. Um, uh, other than that, I mean, it's another great tree say, which is, which is important. I think it's a, uh, it, one of the things I think is interesting about it is that there are no driveways fronting these streets. So, um, that's an interesting way of sort of hiding that parking a little bit. I think that's a, a neat feature to have. A lot of times we do sort of default to pull in garages and and sort of treating these streets as very much a public space uh, is, is an interesting uh, choice for, for this very pocket neighborhood. Um, but otherwise, I think it's uh, it's a good plan. In, anything that we can do, again, to, to keep connectivity going over to, to Clarksville Pike to support uh, private investment that will go on there is really good. And uh, I think overall this will provide good infrastructure upgrades, but the devil is in the details and hopes that the applicants will work a little bit more closely with those immediately adjacent neighbors. But other than that, I'm pleased with the plan. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair Haynes. Uh, so just to reconfirm, uh, the summit road will be uh, improved by this development. And also the cliff road, I think one of the traffic condition is to widen 20 foot uh, between this development, Summit 2 of Buena Vista. So would that be done with, uh, with develop development, with developer's expense? Correct. Okay, great. Well, so with that in mind, I think, you know, I mean, me personally, always struggle when it comes to development with an evolving area. So, you know, density is needed, but evolving, should we rec evolve radically or change, you know, meaningfully? So sometimes, you know, having that uh, density is really concerning, but if we really think about the numbers, you know, this uh, current uh, property under the pod, 
it will be R8. So that means they will be pretty much everywhere. So to preserve a sensitive area or a wooded area, I think introducing multifamily housing makes sense because that's the balance. Instead of single family kind of condensing with a multifamily so we can preserve more wooded area. So it's a little change from uh, the, uh, surrounding single home or two family home development pattern, but in this area to kind of try to balance uh, adding in introducing density while improving uh, street connection and while preserving wooded area. Seems like uh, this proposal kind of uh, strike right balance to me. So I, I think as far as construction, I would like for the development team uh, along with a council lady to and with the neighborhood and they can work always together to construct memorandum understanding for the construction access and our construction. So those can be done. We cannot mandate it, but uh, each you know, developer and community with the council ladies help, it can be done always. So I would like to encourage uh, those continuation. But as far as plan, um, I, I think that's a, a nice balance. So I'm in uh, uh, support for the uh, staff recommendation. Dr. Sims. I really appreciate the comments of all of you guys. It helps me think through this well. Um, I like this idea too because we are going to, I mean, we have to move out and we have to figure out how we're going to do density. I am concerned, and I have seen in other cities, the gentleman's um, safety here and kind of what do you do as you make dents to ensure that the smaller homes, the other kind of homes, are incorporated into this, and I've seen buffers put along the street, particularly in this case where you actually could be, this could be a safety issue. Um, so I would think there's something that we can do, particularly the developer can do, to ensure that this is better incorporated into this and that the smaller homes who are going to pick up a lot more traffic are protected um, here. The other question I have, though, and I think that's something the neighborhood needs to be engaged in to talk about that, is I'm confused because a lot of the letters say, or some of the letters say, that they haven't had a community meeting, and others say that they have. So has a real community meeting been held here? Okay. And Do you want to ask the applicant? Or? Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah. Whoever I need to ask, yeah. Yeah. I'd yeah, like to ask the neighbors if they think it happened. I know they, that Councilmember Toombs did mention in her, during her okay, uh, that she had had a community meeting. I just want to see if they, if if the people, if somebody from the neighborhood can answer that. Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. Okay. 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 <laughs> so I think what I'd like to, you know, we can decide this together, but I do think there is a, a real need here to incorporate the people along Summit whose life is getting ready to change substantially here and how we can better protect their homes. Commissioner Henley. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very familiar with this area. I actually grew up on Summit Avenue, so I'm, I apologize to the neighbors that are here. I probably was a terror and a nuisance in my younger years, riding up and down the street on a bike and making too much noise. Um, but with that being said, I'm also very familiar with the Cliff Drive intersection and the terminus, what is now the terminus in, of Summit Avenue. And, you know, as the, as the, as the neighboring um, property owners stated, you know, there shows an entry and an exit that aligns directly with their front door. <laughs> and, you know, I know not every overlay and every map is extremely accurate, but it just seems really odd that we're showing a new street on directly over someone's home. I just think that just that just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but I also think, again, Summit Avenue and the connectivity, we've talked about how important connectivity is. Um, I think it actually is a really um, strong possibility for connection. But I think, you know, I, not having seen the traffic impact study and not knowing the extent of what will happen off of the site, it sounds like there is some um, improvements that will be made on Cliff Drive. But I really and truly think that Summit Avenue itself will, it will experience a lot of different traffic having that there. I mean, it's, it's gonna become a cut through 
it already was a cut through where people would just go and then make the turn down down cliff and when they realized that they, that it didn't go all the way through um it's been that way for years and we have more and more people that aren't from here and so we'll continue to try it and when they find out it does work I'm, i i can only imagine the amount of traffic that'll come through there i mean I, I, I love the plan. Um, if it was over on a different street, I mean, I wouldn't even be talking anymore. Um, but I, I, I really do think understanding those entry and exit points, both creating an, an intersection, a more significant intersection at Cliff, to me seems interesting with the, the steepness of that street also. So I'm, I'm, that's not my area of expertise, but I'm uncomfortable with the way that it's, it's shown right now. Um, no, those are my comments. I mean, to the extent of it, again, the, the plan itself, the amount of conservation area. I mean, I don't want to speak completely negatively about the plan. I really like it. It is truly where the plan meets the street and the street conditions that I have an issue with. Thank you. All right, we need to vote on these matters separately. We will first consider. Well, I have a, I have a question. Okay, sure. We Chair. continue to discuss. Um, sounds like we're all a bit concerned about the entrance and how it's aligning with the home that's right there. And it sounds like there's a conversation that maybe <coughs> still needs to continue. Maybe you started the conversation at a community meeting, but maybe that conversation still needs to continue and it would be helpful um, to have the, the neighbors, the adjacent neighbors input in that. I wonder if there's appetite for deferral on this item. I have no idea what that means. Um, as it relates to the council, but I wonder if there's the ability to defer to have those conversations continue. There, there is no council legislation at this point. Okay, so that I mean, so it would be very easy to continue those conversations. So I wonder um, if uh, if an, another meeting could be had within, let's say, a, a, I don't know, if a one meeting or two meeting deferral would allow the community to re-engage with the developer and discuss those concerns. I'd also like to get some feedback um, maybe from the commissioner about what an, an exhibit that would be or the type of um, exhibit that you'd want to see to help understand the impact um, of the existing home. And I mean, I've got some in my head, but what, in, as a developer, what, what do you think would be helpful? No, I, I appreciate the question because I was here thinking, I mean, for me, the cliff intersection just is not what I would do. Uh, but more importantly, I think a small study of that, the, the first, I guess, to my left, um, the intersection that is aligned directly across from the home and to see if there is any way to potentially do some type of trade off where the, the street kind of has a little bit more of a, uh, I guess that would be a westward swing to it. Um, it kind of creates some, some sort of a bow um, to where there is probably what I would consider just a safe amount of distance from the entryway um, or potentially just sliding it over so that it does not directly align with someone's home. I mean, I, I would assume it might augment some of um, where the homes are placed and might have to, you know, you have to have somebody do some creative drawing. But to me, an exhibit that shows that, and I, you know, I wouldn't have much more of a problem. I'd speak to, only for myself, but that's what I so, would look for. I think, are you amenable to a deferral? And if so, one I, meeting or two meetings to work out these issues that the commissioners have raised? I'd like to answer that question and then follow it with a statement or an offer, if you would. We, we submitted this in June and did defer in August to do the community meeting. Uh, part of the problem was uh, Council Lady Toombs was heavily involved in the budget, and so there were, there's been quite a few delays. We're at a point where we would very much not like to defer so that we can be to Council by the end of the year. But what I just wanted to help clarify, because we hear the, uh, the neighbor's concern, and I just wanted to help clarify what's happening there. Um, our western access point currently does align with his driveway. And, you know, we, we can move it to the west or we could move it to the east, but it's going to be in somebody's front yard because homes front to Summit Avenue along the south side. I, I, we can move that road west a little bit and have it not align directly with your home. I think we have the ability to move it over 20 or 30 feet and get it not so directly aligned. And we have agreed with Council Lady Toombs that we will meet with her prior to council action to talk about traffic calming and incorporate additional items into the legislation. So um, that, that's all I wanted to add was that we're, we're willing to work with the neighbors. You would prefer to vote tonight and not defer. Vote tonight and not defer and work this out with the council lady. 
Yes, sir. Commissioner Blackshear. Well, I can make a motion. If you, I mean, if you want it just to vote right now. I'm may, I, may I advise the applicant to take the commission's offer to defer for a meeting? It, it, you'll have a better outcome. I, I, we'll, off, I we'll, we'll listen to the commissioners uh, All right. and follow well, then your vote. intent. Okay. So, so no deferral, we're just voting. Okay, I move that we... Uh, oh, did, I mis did I misunderstand? I said we will take the recommendation of the commissioners. To defer. To defer if that's... Oh, okay. That's I'm the sorry. will of the commission. Okay, I misunderstood. I think, you, I think you would be looking likely at a disapproval if they moved forward tonight, just to be direct. <clears throat> so I think you want a deferral to present a different exhibit. Okay. Is my recommendation, correct? Commissioner Blackshear, am I over I can, here? I can, I can move to defer or I can move to disapprove. <laughs> um, I, we're, we're, we're trying to work with the neighborhood, but I think we've been very diligent in our efforts and I apologize that this has come up tonight. We, we have not heard that direct concern until today, so. Which is why we think a deferral, you will have a better outlook in the commission will have the materials that it's asking for. Understood. Thank you. All right, so we are gonna take a motion on item 20A, Commissioner Blackshear. I move to defer two meetings. That is a proper motion. <laughs> Second from someone. Can I make further comment just for- Sure, just for Mr. Henley, go right ahead. Because my well, overall objective is to better inform the applicant as well as at least achieve what I would feel more comfortable with seeing. I would, I would really like for there to be something considered for an augmentation of the right of way. I really think that, again, we talk about the opportunity to better our communities when we have development. I think this is an opportunity to better the, 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 the overall neighborhood by creating an augmented sort of bowing of the street, which can be considered a version of traffic calming itself. Um, but I think it just needs to be done. I'm, I'm, I'm hard pressed to see how the current right of way really solves the problem when you're still going to have a street that runs right up to someone's front door. I mean, I, I mean, it, it works now because it's a terminus and it's a dead end, but when it becomes a through street, I just have, I have a hard time visualizing it, being someone who's seen it time and time and time again. Um, I, I just wanted to make that, but I, I, I'm not objecting. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thank you for that feedback. All right, we have a proper motion and a second to defer one meeting or two, Commissioner Blackshear. Two. Two meetings. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Now to case 20B. Commissioner Blackshear. I move to defer two meetings. We have a proper motion and second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? So items 20A and 20B are deferred to meetings. Thank you for your feedback, neighbors. Thank you. All right, we're on to, at least if I'm correct, item number 31. 27, excuse me. I don't want to skip over 27. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Logan Elliott with the planning department and I'll be presenting item 27 tonight. The request is to rezone properties on Glen Cliff Road to, from RS 7.5 and R8 to RM 9 NS. I would like to point out that the staff reports that were published last Friday uh, published a request for RM 9 and since that time the applicant has updated their request to RM 9 NS which would prohibit short-term rentals from the proposed zoning district 
staff's recommendation is to approve the application. The site is primarily zoned RS 7.5 with a single parcel uh, being zoned R8. This neighborhood being east of Nolensville Pike, west of I-24, <laughs> south of Thompson Lane, and north of the rail line to the south that roughly runs parallel with Antioch Pike was largely rezoned from R8 to RS 7.5 in 2003 through an application initiated by the district council member and the R8 parcel here was omitted from that application to rezone to R7.5. The policy for this site being east of Glencliff Road is suburban neighborhood evolving, which intends to create and enhance suburban residential neighborhoods with more housing choices, improved pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular connectivity with moderate density patterns and moderate setbacks and spacing between buildings. The conservation policy is limited to slopes that are associated with the interstate that abuts the site to the rear and across the street and west of Glencliff Road is neighborhood maintenance policy. Here we have the major and street or major and collector street plan displayed showing that the site is uh, in close proximity to collector avenues and arterial boulevards with Thompson Lane being 0.7 miles from the site to the north and Antioch Pike being about a quarter of a mile to the south and the Briley Parkway and I-24 interchange is also nearby. The application includes seven parcels and comprises approximately 10.9 acres in South Nashville. The site fronts onto Glencliff Road, a local street, and the site is currently developed with single family residences and two family residences. The site is generally flat with no slopes, no floodplain or no floodway present. And the surrounding area includes a mixture of housing types with multifamily units uh, abutting the site to the south and being directly across Glencliff Road. And the area also contains single family residential. And uh, Glencliff Elementary is south of the site at the western corner of the intersection of Glencliff Road and Antioch Pike. Staff's recommendation is to approve. The application proposes a density and form that is consistent with the suburban neighborhood evolving policy and the guidance to provide infill development in a suburban pattern, but at higher densities and with greater housing variety than classic suburban neighborhoods. The proposed pattern is also appropriate with the surrounding development pattern, considering the area has an established pattern of multifamily attached structures and the proposed zoning district would provide for a similar form and density. This particular site is constrained uh, by the existing development to the south and the existence of the interstate to the east and its ability to provide a public street network. Therefore, the proposed district of RM9 and the likely private drives that would be created through the development of the site are appropriate in this area. And the conservation area is really only associated with the construction of the interstate to the east. Therefore, staff finds the proposal to be consistent with policy and recommends approval. That completes my presentation here. Answer any questions. Thank you, Logan. The applicant will have 10 minutes. If you'll please come up and state your name and address. Hi there, my name is Preston Ayer with SWS Engineering, located at 504 Autumn Springs Court, Franklin, Tennessee. And I am the civil engineer on the project, um, here representing uh, Brent Smith, the developer. And we are in agreement with staff's recommendation. Um, I wanted to hand out to you, while I know that the site plan is not under review, I just want to look hand you a sketch that we had shown um, at our latest community meeting. We've had uh, two community meetings for this rezoning. And I wanted to just point out um, that the rezoning will allow for 98 units. This sketch is currently showing 94 units. Um, we are maintaining 40 foot setbacks to Glencliff Road, as well as 40 foot setback to the I-24 right away. And doing this with maintaining about 40% open space uh, on the project. Uh, a large majority of that open space is, uh, you can see about two acres of a natural park area at the rear that we would be proposing uh, with a walking trail that would be open to 
both this development and in the community uh, as well. Uh, and I just wanted to let you know that we would be willing to work with, you know, as we get into the design phase on this, um, all metro departments, NDOT, uh, water services, stormwater, uh, to make sure that all aspects of the design meet those, their requirements. And I'll also invite Brent up to speak, and we would like to keep two minutes for rebuttal as well. Very good. Uh, yes, my name is Brent Smith. I live at 4423 Leland Lane in Nashville. Um, a couple of things I wanted to go over. Can you all hear me well enough? Okay. Um, on this development is, as you can see, this is an assemblage of land, and it started out with just two pieces of property, and then as neighbors knew that we were developing, they came to us. Once we saw the the assemblage that we were getting, what we did, we stopped and we listened to, we had our first community meeting. The items that came up of interest, the main items were tree preservation because of the buffer between I-24 and the adjoining neighborhood um, and traffic. That was the biggest thing. And, and the, when, we, when everyone's referring to traffic on this development, I want to be sure and be clear about something. Glencliff is a cut through over to um, Thompson Lane. So when we listened to the community, the neighborhood, uh, the first thing we did, we kind of turned everything on end. I stopped our engineer, we, we, any design we were doing, and we went and immediately did a tree survey. And if you'll notice on what was handed out to you, all these little dots you see everywhere, those are trees that are actually located on the development. And so we're actually saving 85% of the trees that are on site. We shifted our development to that area. Another thing that I think is important is we're maintaining a 40% open space on an 11 acre, 10.9 acre track, which that's a little over 4.3 acres that are remaining as open space. The other thing that you're gonna hear from the, from the community that we learned from our community meetings was th with Glencliff being a cut through, we went to public works and talked to them about what can we do and, and the idea that we came up with was uh, installing a roundabout at our property and the way Glencliff is situated between the right-of-ways, we're able to do that 100% on our property, not have to uh, go to the apartment complex that has about, I'm not sure how many, there's several hundred units you can see there uh, uh, that we're not having to affect them at all. So we're able to install a roundabout and actually put a bend in Glencliff that is, and in, that will involve traffic calming. And the key to traffic calming is points of resistance. You just wanna make people go somewhere else. So we listen to the neighborhood and those are things that we're doing. Um, another thing what we did by turning everything on its, on its head, so to speak, as far as the design process and the development process goes, we looked at what the, we, we view this as a infill project. So we looked at what is the neighborhood, what are the average price per square foot, what are the homes selling for in that area? Um, we took those numbers, back that in to what a price point, so we have three different price points we'll be selling at, in the low fours to the mid to upper fours. So we have three different price points that are in line with the neighborhood as it is now. And we did all of that, we took into account the open space, the trees, the, the around $750,000 worth of improvements we're gonna be doing on Glencliff and uh, the price points of the homes. And that's how we arrived at the density that we're at. And it's, that's how we, so we didn't go, what's the maximum amount of homes we can put there to make the most amount of money we possibly can. We flipped it on its head and said, all right, how can we infill this into the community and let it blend into the neighborhood and provide benefits between open space, helping on Glencliff with the cut through traffic, doing stuff there along it. And that's how we arrived at our numbers. So I wanted to save us some time, but um, we'll be happy to answer any questions y'all have. Thank you so much. You will have two minutes for rebuttal. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support of the project? Come on up. Come on up. Please state your name and address, and you'll have two minutes. Matt and Dada. My name is Joe Bain Colvert. I live at 224 Antioch Pike, just around the corner from this rezoning on Glencliff Road. Full disclosure, 
I am a realtor with Parks, and I am representing some of the sellers uh, in this potential transaction. I believe that to deny this application or to prove anything dense, in, anything less dense than nine units an acre, is antithetical to the purpose, intent, and spirit of Nashville's 25-year uh, general plan, Nashville Next. This tool has guided the purview of Metro planning staff and this commission for the past five years. Not surprisingly, this era coincides with a historic boom in residential development across the city. That is everywhere except the 16th district. Using Metro's open data site, I found the number of new residential building permits per district for the last three years, which you have in front of you there. Uh, within a five mile radius, uh, of downtown when compared to the other districts, the 16th has more than six times fewer new residential building permits than the average central council district. That is removing the high and low outliers of the 19th and 18th. These core nine districts have an average of 509 new residential permits in the last three years. The 16th, by comparison, has had only 84 permits. Clearly the 16th has not pulled its weight when it comes to building new housing. Currently, there are 5,081 residential lots in the 16th. 91% of those are single family. Only 9% are two family. Uh, on top of that, most of the district has a neighborhood maintenance policy, this being one of the, th one of the three uh, evolving policies in the district. Uh, now, many opposing this rezoning are going to argue that this is a single family neighborhood. Well, from an urban planning perspective, this area has not been a single family neighborhood since the former owners of the properties directly across from this development sold their backyards to create gazebo apartments in the mid 1970s. This is a trend that was repeated twice in the mid 80s and again in 2000. Uh, just to point out right here, there's 1,129 multifamily units in these, this general area. There's 69 single family homes. So yeah, not a single family neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else wishing to speak in support of the project? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. If you'll state your name and address, you'll have two minutes each. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Greathouse. I live at 3135 Glencliff Road, and I'm speaking in opposition. Uh, I, I want to say thanks to our, our council lady, Jenny Wells. She's been really helpful throughout this whole process. And, and thanks to the, to the uh, developers as well for being open and, and having the, the two meetings that we've had so far. Um, I, I understand that growth in Nashville is, is both needed and inevitable, but I'm here to argue that if growth is to happen, it should happen responsibly. I do not believe that the growth of this rezoning would allow, um, would be responsible, a responsible course of action for our neighborhood. Glencliff Road and Nice Drive, which are functionally the same road, are already plagued with issues related to traffic. It is a small cut through street that is in sore need of updates, even before taking this development into consideration. Adding 94 homes where there were originally seven would turn this small cut through into a thoroughfare in its own right, in, in my thinking, and would be like pouring gasoline onto a fire. Uh, if this were happening on a uh, major road like Thompson Lane or Antioch Pike, I would feel little compulsion to resist it, but Glencliff and Nice are decidedly not those kinds of roads. And so we ask for some kind of guarantee that the so-called fire that we're trying to put out before making it worse um, is something that we can deal with. But our only assurances have been from the developer giving us his word and from our councilwoman saying that Nice has been on the to-do list for years, but that there hasn't been any money or incentive to address those issues. Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong about that. While I have no desire nor reason to doubt the developer's word, my main concern is that they will not be able to follow through with improvements to the neighborhood in terms of traffic for reasons beyond their control. Uh, as a side note, I would also like to, to say that both, well, I already said this, but that they've been very cooperative. So I, I don't mean to say any of this as an affront to their willingness to work with us as a community. Um, so I guess just in closing real quick, uh, you know, I, I would respectfully ask that you guys uh, deny the request for rezoning. And if there's any doubt as to the traffic issues currently plaguing your neighborhood, I would recommend all of you to take a walk up and down Nice Drive during peak hours of the day and ask yourself if that road can handle up to 180 more cars during that time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next. My name is Alan Dyer. I live at uh, 
3137 Glencliff Road. I've lived there for 107 years. Uh, slight exaggeration. Um, there are a myriad of hazardous and frustrating traffic conditions on this corridor of Nisi Drive and Glencliff Road. And um, implementing five times the population on Glencliff Road is clearly going to make that more complicated. So that begs for solutions um, uh, up and down the streets for uh, uh, making traffic manageable and, and keeping it uh, efficient and safe. Um, we have had, and, and I will, will give our developers some credit, some good conversations. And in broad strokes, we have come to some kinds of agreements about what can be done, but uh, we're lacking some detail there. Um, uh, issues in, include things like uh, putting, uh, uh, putting the sidewalk funds uh, on Nisi Drive rather than Glencliff Road because that's where the sidewalk funds are desperately needed. It, it's a fairly hazardous situation for them. And I, I think they were uh, amenable to that concept. Um, the speeding traffic uh, needs solutions. Um, uh, we need a solution for the Glencliff Elementary School pickup lines, which obstruct traffic totally on that street for 20 or 30 minutes a day each school day. And it can also create some awkward traffic situations, uh, particularly with uh, um, drivers who are trying to find creative ways to uh, bypass that, that pickup line. Uh, we can suggest some solutions. Uh, for example, that um, uh, those pickup lines could be moved onto school property with some redesign of their parking space. But I do want to say that uh, I, I think that these solutions very much depend on the correct involvement of uh, public works and, and the school to be partners in this project, um, to give the allowances that uh, needed to be given to make this uh, uh, traffic solution work. Um, and I, I think that's sort of where it resides. There's a little bit of insecurity right there about, um, you know, if we're going to get the full cooperation of Metro Schools and uh, Public Works for this project. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. Next. Hi, my name is Kelly Sparkman, and I live at 504 Twin Oaks Circle. And I'd like to thank you for listening to us this evening. Um, I have lived there since 2005. It's my very first home I purchased. And um, 27 homes were built there because the developer who had Twin Oaks could not build any more multifamily homes in that area. He was forced to build single-family homes because he was denied in 2005. So I bought a home there. Now they're trying to put these homes. And I'm not, I understand that development's going to happen. I'm not opposed to development. But 94 homes in that area is very dangerous. Um, what they were talking about, Nice, yesterday, I saw a woman with a child in a carrier run to the side in a ditch with her child because cars were coming and would not get over. She was almost killed. Um, and uh, also, the tree canopy, I'm close to I-24, so during the summer, I don't hear it as much. And it also absorbs sound and pollution and things of that nature. We've asked about having um, a wall put up, and they, they have made the comment that, well, it's, we have that cliff over there, so we don't hear it as much. So um, also, I'm concerned about the water pressure. We already have a very low water pressure. And um, I have been passed also on Glencliff and Nice um, two by two, people going around me racing. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen, you need to go online and look how the racers, um, and they do it here in Nashville, I've seen them, uh, race around the roundabout. One goes to the left and one goes to the right. Roundabouts don't stop them. Uh, we used to have um, speed bumps on Twin Oaks Drive. Beautiful yellow speed bumps, just very shallow. And these little flivers, as my mom and I called them, they would come and they would stop and they would tear out. Made more noise and someone's gonna get hurt. And that's our biggest thing is the safety. I would be more than willing to accept 
the um, RM6 for them to resubmit or to what it's already um, done at. So thank you. Thank you so much. Next. My name is Bill Weeks. I live at 3208 Glencliff Road, which I've been there for 30 years. Uh, the developments are coming, and I understand, but he did talk about the stagnation of District 16, as in growth and building permits. Well, we like it that way. That's, that's kind of why. <laughs> and, uh, but the biggest issue with this, like they say, is the Glencliff Nice corridor through there. The, our concerns are something the developer has very little control over, is our traffic situation, the backups at Thompson, I mean Thompson Lane, South Lake, Glencliff, at Antioch Pike, the school issue. The roundabout will turn our traffic from a drag strip to a Le Mans or a Grand Prix race, so they go in circles. So um, if, if it, if there was anything, I mean, there's really no room to widen the roads. I mean, I have substantial property, an acre and a half. I got frontal room. I could sell right away to widen the road to three lanes and traffic move in two and one. But outside of that, I, I just don't see how we accommodate a, not the traffic from 94 more homes with possibly 180 more cars a day on the road. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next. Thank you for coming. Please state your name and address and you'll be given two minutes. Verna Sparkman at 504 Twin Oak Circle. Uh, that was my daughter that just spoke. Uh, we, we understand there will be more density, but like everyone has said, uh, it's like we don't really have two streets. We have one street that has a 15 mile an hour corner. And so at one end, we're blocked in at Antioch and Antioch and Glencliff. At the other end, when it's uh, between two and five o'clock, we're blocked in at South Lake. We, uh, this last week, we waited through three lights to turn right to go to Kroger off of Nice Drive onto uh, South Lake, which goes across Thompson Lane. But it, it's a beautiful neighborhood with wonderful tree canopy. We have lots of birds. And like uh, my daughter said about the, about the sound from I-24, the, the tree canopy helps that, besides the beauty. And we just hope you will uh, consider uh, maybe less houses than in 94 and thank you for hearing me thank you so much for coming anybody else we can wishing to speak in opposition seeing none applicant you'll be have it given two minutes for rebuttal uh, thank you um first of all i'd like to compliment our i've been doing development for a very long time i'm older than i look um and i, but I want to say that our interactions with this community group has been the best I've ever had. It was actual dialogue that went back and forth. It wasn't a lot of it, you know, y'all have all heard neighborhood meetings. Sometimes they get brutal. This was an actual dialogue. So we did listen to them. And it was interesting to hear one of the things that was coming up that, that we just heard from these people again, from the neighbors again, was, um, for example, the sound. Well, I could go into my background as far as when I was in my future life sound attenuation, the project engineer with Boeing and the Department of Defense, but sound, by having these, the homes that we're putting there, and if you'll notice how they're put in place, they're not just randomly put there. Those homes will be there 20, you know, 12 months out of the year, fall and winter. That They will deflect sound when the leaves on the trees are gone. Another thing I want to be sure and stress is, again, we're saving 85% of the trees that are there. So I think we've done a good job as far as that goes. One of the other items that's come up is, and we've talked, we have spoken with um, with Public Works, and what we're negotiating with them now is, and it's going to be a process. But there's already sidewalk on Glencliff now, 
And instead of us just putting, you know, the, the money that goes into the sidewalk fund that goes into who knows where the hell that money goes, okay, I'll be honest with you. I'd like to earmark it to be on NICE, and we're negotiating that with Public Works now. And we're willing to sign, I know I've only got a few seconds, we're willing to sign a community benefits agreement after we go through the negotiations with Public Works as far as the traffic circle that goes in, the improvements that we're going to be, traffic speed tables that we're also going to be putting in. There's a layered effect that we're going to be doing as far as the public works and the traffic coming we're going to be doing on Glencliff. So we're in negotiations with public works on all of these things now, and we're willing to sign and want to sign a community benefits agreement with public works when this is completed. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. I will declare the public hearing closed and start with Mr. Henley. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, one, uh, again, I'm broken record when it comes to the need for, for density and, and, and housing. Um, familiar with this area also, and, you know, I, I get disheartened because a lot of times we, we start the conversations off and we hear about how our infrastructure has failed our, our citizens, right? And then we place it on the developer who usually are looking, you know, right immediately in front of their property. And usually the issues go much farther than that. So I'm really glad to hear about the amount of creativity and conversation that's going forward into that. And I've spoken a few times, um, council, council member uh, Welch, and I know, you know her main things are no short-term rentals, and you guys check that box, and then, of course, traffic calming, and it looks like you are doing what you can and being creative with how you can do things there. Um, I honestly saw the roundabout, and I was like, I don't know why. <laughs> I, mean, I, I like roundabouts. I think they're cool, but I also think that a lot of people in, in our city don't know how to use them. And then I think at night, they're right. They, they become something totally different. Um, so I would just, you know, consider rethinking that one. But um, other than that, I don't, I don't have a lot of objections. I know, again, the density seems to be pretty um, severe based on what's there today. But if you look at the surroundings of it, I mean, it's already a pretty dense area. Um, I think part of that is why there are some challenges navigating now at certain times of day. Uh, but I think, again, I wish we could, we did, we do record these, but we could just play these back a lot of times during budget hearings and just, you know, target some of these projects. I think there's a real collaboration and a great idea there um, to work with, with schools and, and NDOT to look at how to better stage um, the drop off and pick up times there because I've, I've experienced it being an issue. But again, staying on, staying on topic and what we have here, I don't. I'm, I'm, I commend the amount of work you guys have done looking at the at the tree canopy that's there and preserving it. I was going to make the same comment about the about the homes um, being a sound barrier based on how they're located along the along the backside of the property. Other than that, I'll I'll, I'll pass the mic on to my fellow commissioners. Thank you, Dr. Sims. Uh, what is your name, please? Brent Smith. Brent Smith. It truly is a pleasure to meet you. Oh, thanks. Um, I have been excited. I think this one is I went and looked at this, and this is this piece of property really is calling for some attention. But the fact that you could back into the, your price point, that you took seriously the definition of infill, is something we rarely see. And most people are trying to get the most amount of money and the crowd as much as you can in. And, we would probably be in a much bigger mess if our staff we didn't pay a lot of attention to that. So I'm really grateful that you're doing this. I know I live in, the, in a, this, a similar area and the traffic is out of control, but I don't know what you know, the Planning Commission can do about traffic when housing is just as important as, as traffic. So I just want primarily to thank you for um, really modeling for other people what it means to pay attention to price point to the actual uh, contextual part of this neighborhood and to the fact that you're willing to do a CBA to back up whatever you want. We never hear that, so thank you. And I'm very hard, I wholeheartedly support this. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do appreciate the intention of, you know, what kind of uh, development you intend to make and especially uh, preserve uh, the trees uh, because that would be a great buffer from the sound from uh, intersection. And I do appreciate community engagement. I th think, you know, as far as uh, policy concerns, adding density in this location makes sense. And, but, but 
you know, I'm uh, always a big proponent of a specific plan. So, you know, especially the development team and the community engaged in this, uh, you know, this much uh, detailed engagement seems like, you know, putting all the condition into the, you know, SP zoning makes sense. So community will have guarantee, you know, especially, you know, what kind of uh, housing or buffer or protection they will be getting. But, you know, as of right now, I understand there have been great conversation, but since this is just straight, you know, zoning, so this wonderful developer one day goes away, the next developer, you, uh, somebody buy it and then develop the way according to the just the density. So that's uh, my reservation. You know, of course, not everybody uh, will face that kind of situation, but that's the reality. So for that, I do have a little reservation. So perhaps, you know, council lady going forward, uh, she will really hold the developer to the words and then come up with a community you know, benefit agreement and so forth. And we may see great development in that area. And, you know, so only reservation is this is the, a straight zoning, but I'm willing to listen to other commissioners. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you to the applicant for providing this information, especially the site plan. I know that was something that I was interested in. Uh, one of the things I was interested in is the access points and whatnot. I'm familiar with this area. I worked over in Berry Hill for more years than I would like to say, but uh, I, I know some of these streets is a cut through myself. Um, <laughs> hate to admit that, but, uh, um, but so I'm familiar with that area. Um, uh, uh, in terms of the conversation about uh, building permits, you know, uh, a lot of this area had been down zoned uh, by prior council members. Uh, and I know that council member Welsh, uh, I haven't had an opportunity to serve with her very long, about only about two years, but uh, I know that uh, for her coming into council, um, providing more housing and especially at different price points is something that I've heard her speak to a lot uh, uh, in her deliberations. So I, I think that council member Welsh is looking for ways uh, sometimes to add day dues or to add uh, some multifamily in, in appropriate places. And uh, that is a real goal of hers is to make sure that um, that this neighborhood doesn't become one uh, that is exclusive uh, in terms of the, the limited number of housing units available being so expensive. So that's a good goal. Um, I, I, I understand the concerns of my uh, colleague, uh, Commissioner Johnson, about um, you know, having a lot of conversations with the community but not really having guarantees in place that those things will occur. And, uh, I, I do believe that we need to get to a point where we don't have to do SPs all the time. Uh, I think that they are useful tools sometimes, but uh, we also need to get to a point where we can do base zonings and just work with our departments to make sure we have good reviews uh, on what gets built by right within base zoning. And so I'm pretty comfortable there. Um, this is a, uh, a series of parcels. I think if this were one parcel, it might be uh, less risky in some ways that someone could start getting zoning entitlements and parceling them off. But at the same time, with these applicants having engaged with the community to the level that they have, I, I feel like that establishes a level of trust. Um, I understand that uh, NDOT staff have been working with y'all uh, on some of these ideas, which aren't finalized yet. And, Maybe a roundabout doesn't have to happen, but uh, it sounds like other traffic calming uh, devices have been discussed with NDOT, as I understand it, uh, and I know that the NDOT staff are uh, eager to, to do what they can. Um, the, um, the, the sidewalk fund is uh, an issue a little bit because you don't necessarily know where the sidewalk funds are gonna go. One of the things that we've talked about when we brought forward the sidewalk bill itself, uh, and we've talked about it a little bit is, Sometimes the intention of saying, well, what, we need sidewalks over here and can we put these funds there is, uh, it's a good intention, but sometimes what you end up with is that the amount of funds that are contributed are not actually sufficient to build sidewalks even on that block. And then you still have to work with 
um, utilities and private property owners and right away and things like that. So I think it's a really good gesture uh, to want to do that. And if, if NDOT finds a way to do it, great. But just want to share that experience uh, as a council member that has had communities that want a sidewalk in a specific area and uh, that approach of limiting sidewalk funds to a specific block doesn't always, isn't always fruitful. Um, so just want to put that out there. Um, otherwise, I think this is a pretty good plan. Um, I like the tree saves. Um, uh, I do like the idea that I think has been commented on that if these are built as attached homes, that they will provide a good sound buffer. Uh, if you go to, uh, uh, I think, some of the larger cities in particular, if you have uh, an interstate or a highway or a, an L train, you'll see a wall of multifamily that doesn't always have a lot of windows, but uh, but does provide sound barrier to the neighborhood. So that, uh, in my experience, that is true, that the the buildings themselves provide more of a sound barrier than the than even the trees would. But uh, overall, I think it's a, it's a good plan that we have. I know we're not, we're not reviewing all the details of the plan, but uh, I appreciate the diligence of the team working with the neighbors and with council member uh, Welsh. And I'm confident that even as a base zoning district, that if we work with the council member and the, uh, the metro departments, that we will come up with a plan that uh, improves the community and provides more housing. Thank you. Commissioner Blackshire. Well, it's certainly interesting to see neighbors and developers so complementary of each other. So that's nice to see and refreshing. We certainly do not see that the majority of the time. Um, it is a nice plan for everything that the commissioner has already stated. Obviously, the sound buffer aspect is wonderful. Um, I do wonder, I mean, we've heard the neighbors and anyone, obviously, who's just familiar with Nashville on a very high-level area will know that traffic is a real issue. And I just wonder, um, at what point is it irresponsible of us to, to approve such a dense development when we know traffic is really bad? And um, Commissioner Sims' point is well taken. We need housing in Nashville. Obviously, everyone knows that. People are moving here. And we want to make the place affordable for those who make um, a normal, non-millionaire living. Um, and so that requires building more houses, right, having more supply. And I just wonder... Um, when we're providing too much supply in one area. And um, Commissioner Henley loves his incremental density. Um, and um, I've started saying radical density. That's going to be my phrase now. And so I, I wonder, like, where, where, is that, where is that dividing line between something that's obviously we're in a neighborhood evolving area, so we're evolving, but where do you go from incremental density to too much of a change. And I don't know that there's any set rule. Maybe it's just something, it has to be on a case-by-case -case basis, but maybe it's something that you see it, um, that you know it when you see it. So I think the plan is really good. I think it is commendable how well the neighbors and the developers have worked together. I just wonder, is, is something less than 98 units um, preferable here if we know we're in an area that has really bad traffic issues, um, are we putting too much in one area? And, and that's not something that's unique to this item, obviously. It's a question that we face a lot and that we will face again. And that's more of a question to the commissioners. If, if folks have looked at it and think that 98 units in this area is appropriate, then, then that's fine. It's just a, it's a, a question that I think is worth pondering. Thank you. Other comments? Dr. Sims? I want to thank very much uh, your comments because I think that is a serious question we have to solve. I don't think we've set a precedent yet for when we decide it's too much, and I'm not sure we can do that with this case, but I, your point is very well taken, and I appreciate it. We do need to decide at what point do we cross over and we're allowing too much density. We need a motion. Council Withers. Actually, uh, Mr. Chair, could I make an additional comment as well? <laughs> um, one of the things I really want uh, us to think about with, with this, sometimes you, you hear a traffic count and it sounds like a large number. Um, but um, if you have racing going on on a street um, or speeding, I just want to throw this out there as a counter that what that sometimes 
is indicative of is that there is not a lot of traffic, at least at that time. And so sometimes one of the things about density is that the thing that will truly slow down a driver or make a driver drive the speed limit is the vehicle in front of that driver that is driving the speed limit, right? And so sometimes density actually provides a, enough of a, a context of flow of traffic that ironically um, helps to reduce the speeding because usually the speeding is going on during times when there's, there are not other cars present, usually. Now, I live next to Gallatin and I see some crazy things myself. Um, but just want to kind of throw that out there and even like from the, the, the standpoint of we're, like if we went from 98 units to 60 units in terms of thinking about uh, from the, um, the amount of time that it's going to take that difference of cars to go through, you probably are talking about a couple of minutes out of a day. Um, and so like reducing the, the density count from let's say 90 to 60 um, is not going to provide that much of a, an amount of traffic relief necessarily. I just want to throw that out there. And another thing about it too is with residential density, I mean, sometimes you, you do have morning and evening commutes, which, which are, are uh, certainly are a factor. But uh, again, I go back to that that provides a little bit more of a stable um, amount of uh, traffic on the streets than the, than the school issue per se, which is very concentrated in, into a couple periods of the day. So I, I think that's a good point and just I think we're going to have really good discussions about that uh, about this and we, we don't really have a line about how much <coughs> new density is too much density. But uh, I just want to throw that out there that reducing the, the uh, density entitlements on this, let's say from 90 units to 60, is not probably not going to provide that much of uh, a relief to any traffic concerns. And so the going back to, again, the, the housing supply being needed in this area in a neighborhood evolving policy meets policy. It is not immediately adjacent to a transit corridor, but it, but it is helping to support uh, transit corridors and transit ridership at some level and providing some opportunities for uh, for different price points for housing. So I think, again, from a policy standpoint, uh, which is where we're at, uh, this is appropriate, and hopefully the council member can continue working with the applicant and the community. Ultimately, the zone change will be a zoning decision by the council member that the council will, will consider. But I think that from a, a policy standpoint, this does meet the neighborhood evolving policy. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Comments? Otherwise, I need a motion. Chairman, may I ask one question uh, regarding uh, tree preservation? Because since it's a straight zoning, uh, we cannot do anything about it. But if when this development is complete or in the process, if there is HOA or this entity, they can put by deed or HOA to dedicate that area as a conservation area. Is that doable uh, in the development team side? I mean, I think the development team can make private agreements with the community in regards to, to preservation, but those would not be agreements that would be um, ones that would be enforced by Metro. Um, I think that it would be tree preservation, um, not necessarily a conservation easement, which typically would have a conservation organization as a party to the easement, but they could make private agreements with the community, but those just would not be enforceable by Metro. Thank you. May I ask development one question in that regard? Would you be willing to put that when you are talking with the community, uh, your intent to preserve uh, that back area as a Absolutely. And, and one of the things in our last uh, meeting, if I can speak for a second, in our last community meeting, uh, that question came up. And I said, if you want to look at what, incent what does incentivize anyone to do what they're doing? Well, several things, but if we're talking about real estate development. It's, I love doing this. I love, I've been doing this for a very long time. I, I honestly believe that, um, if I can go on a little bit of a diatribe here, if you'll just allow me just a quick Years ago, I was doing a very contentious rezoning down in Green Hills. It was brutal. One of my neighbors was head of the neighborhood association. She was horrific. And I finally looked at her and I said, do you live in a home? And she said, yeah, you know where I live, Brent. I live around the corner from you. I said, do you work anywhere? 
She goes, yeah, I work downtown. Uh, I said, do you ever go shopping, go to restaurants, you do anything like that? She said, of course I do. And I said, let me explain something to you. Every place you went was brought to you by a private developer who risked his money, his time, and his talents to develop the cities that we're doing. Now, are there bad guys who absolutely go after nothing but money? 100%, but that's not the way we look at this. We look at it, me and my partners, as just what we're doing. We're developing homes for people that are in that price point. We could be out here developing the two, three million dollar houses. Don't want to do it. That's not what that's not what this is about. That's not what makes the city better. But but when you talk about incentivizing someone to do what they say they're going to do, what better incentive is it than to, that everything that we're proposing? And this is what I love about the feedback we got from the community. Everything that they're wanting, guess what it does? It makes our development that we're doing that much more valuable and that much better to sell. So by keeping the trees there, 100% we want to do that. Will we have an HOA put that together? Absolutely. But you know what else it does? When, when the realtors are out there selling those townhomes, they're going to be able to say, look at this beautiful park over here and look at all these trees that are here. So that's the best incentive, best incentive when, when two things can work at the same time. What's good for us and our, the profit that we want to make, which isn't, you know, it's a profit. I mean, I'm not going to ever apologize for making a living and making a profit. But when the two things can work hand in hand, that's the best incentive you can ever have. So will there be an HOA? That's a long answer to your question. To preserve those things, 100%. And we're not going to be gating this community and keeping that park away from the rest of the neighborhood. We want people to interact because that makes everything better. So, Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate the commitment. Yeah. Uh, with that, Chairman, I would like to make a motion to approve uh, uh, this project with uh, condition <laughs> with the staff recommendation. That's a proper motion. Second? second. Commissioner Henley, we have a proper motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We are on to item 31. Lisa, is that correct? Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Seth Harrison with the Planning Department, and I'll be presenting item number 31. This request is to rezone from the residential zoning R8 to the commercial zoning of OR20. The site outlined in red is located on the north side of Buena Vista Drive, southwest of Cliff Drive. Currently, the site consists of a two-family residential structure. While there is some light commercial uses nearby, majority uses within this area are residentially based or vacant. The staff recommendation is to disapprove. Currently, the site is zoned R8, with the neighboring properties being zoned primarily R8 as well, with CL, CN, and a few SPs in the area. The policy for the site is T4 Urban Neighborhood Evolving. T4 Urban Neighborhood Evolving is a residential-based policy with some institutional and community uses permitted under special exception. Within this residential policy, no commercial-based zoning should, would be considered consistent with the goals of residential development. Currently, the existing zoning of RA is consistent with the policy goals of T4 Urban Neighborhood Evolving, and the proposed commercial zoning of OR20 would be inconsistent with these policy goals. The staff recommendation is to disapprove. Thank you, Seth. The applicant will be given 10 minutes. Please state your name and address. Good evening, all commissioners. My name is Clark Zucker, and I live at 600 12th Avenue South. And I certainly appreciate your time this evening. So I brought a visual tonight to maybe provide a little bit more clarification on the thought process behind the rezoning request. So as you can see here, let me know if you can't hear me. As you can see here, we have a commercially zoned property uh, adjacent to where our lot is. Also, SP project is zoned just north, and then about, Point three, uh, point a third of a mile uh, southwest down the uh, down the street, you have another OR20. So our thought was, <clears throat> after the pandemic, it bred 
a lot of folks that would potentially want a work-live environment. So we thought it'd be a unique offering to build basically exactly what's there to the north side of our lot, um, which is right, ag uh, right up against the uh, improving, uh, excuse me, the Goodrich Avenue that's currently being improved. So we thought, okay, that's unique, and it's also somewhat consistent with the, what's already in the area because there's obviously several uh, commercially uh, zoned uh, uh, parcels. But with that said, we have zero intention of any you know, actual commercial application. It's simply just to offer tenants you know, uh, a custom-built house that would offer something that could uh, be within the Metro's uh, guidelines with a live-to-work environment. So that's all I have right now. And then, of course, there's nothing different. Again, it's just literally mirror, uh, mirroring <clears throat> two other units north of what's already itself of the lot. So that's it. Thank you for your time. We will save two minutes for rebuttal. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? All right, seeing none, I guess you won't need your two minutes of rebuttal. I will uh, declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Johnson, I will start with you on this one. Thank you. Uh, so I think the self recommendation uh, to disapprove is uh, based on uh, community policy because a T4 neighborhood evolving. Is that correct? Correct. So under the OR20, uh, how many units will be allowed to build in that 0 0.31 acres? Six. So a six unit maximum. Hmm. So it seems like 0 0.31. I mean, I could see that, you know, changing to uh, office, especially uh, right next to the commercial development, but seems like six unit allowable in this a tiny lot by zone seems a bit too much. And of, also I can see if, you know, it was fully supported by surrounding neighbor, we can amend the community, but I, as of right now, I have not seen any overwhelming support from the community, uh, as far as I can see from the you know, public comment. So I really don't see why do we have to bend uh, the community character manual at this point to accommodate up to six units in this particular lot. So that's where I am right now. I'm willing to listen to other commissioners. Councilman Withers. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate the applicants coming forward. Uh, I, I kind of agree with Councilmember Johnson that you know, the community plan, uh, uh, it, the, the commercial uses, uh, at least those entitled in OR20 are not supported by the community plan. The Metro Council did pass legislation that does allow home-based businesses up to six, uh, I think, um, visitors a day, we don't have any way of enforcing that necessarily, but um, but Metro Council did pass that that allows home-based businesses. Uh, there is a sunset provision for that at the end of this council term. Uh, I had great skepticism about it myself as a council member that has a, a very mixed use kind of neighborhood. Um, I'm willing to share that so far I haven't heard any outstanding amounts of uh, complaints about that from from my neighbors who are very vocal about most everything. So uh, I'm, I'm not certain that the council would end that uh, in a couple of years, but that's, that's kind of difficult to say. But uh, at least for right now, uh, home-based businesses are approved. Um, you as a builder do have an opportunity, obviously, to sort of build to that uh, in the sense that sometimes people use like a back bedroom as a home office. You could build, you know, you could design the home in, in a sort of way that better accommodates that um, and, and maybe that is a little bit more of the way homes will be designed in the future anyway. Um, but it's just unfortunately the case that the, the policy doesn't support it. I think that we would need to have 
to me, the one thing that, that, that I've run into in District 6 is in some cases, way back in the day, there was some, some parcels that were adjacent to a neighborhood center that were zoned at Laura 20 already. And so, uh, but the community plan through Nashville Next, for whatever reason, didn't get updated to include those, right? So there were a few outliers there where there was some legacy OR20 in, in some of my area that we uh, uh, kept, right? We didn't make them cease doing that, and they already had businesses that were in them, and so that would have been disruptive to them. But so to me, it's that's the only way that I think that I would support something like that for an OR20 in a residential-only policy is if something had happened way back in the past where there were maybe like a... Uh, a business that was already there that otherwise would become a legally non-conforming use. Uh, but I do think the community plan process is important and unfortunately it just doesn't support that. However, uh, what I did want to throw out there, and I don't know what your communications have been with uh, the council member in the community, but if the idea is to offer more units on the site, that perhaps uh, what could be considered is maybe an, uh, an RM20 that would get you some additional residential units there. And I don't know if planning staff have considered that, but, but that may be a, a conversation that you could have in terms of getting additional units on the site, which seems to be part of what you're interested in. Um, it's just that the, the office component um, as a formalized office space isn't supported by the community plan. And so for that, I have to support the staff recommendation. Commissioner Blackshire. Really nothing more to add. I mean, our hands are tied um, by what policy provides. And if the zoning, proposed zoning, is incongruent with policy, then there's there's no ability for us really to support it. Um, again, to echo what the councilman said and what um, Council Lady Toome said, perhaps there's still an ability to offer the tenants what you would like to offer because of the ability to have those with six visitors a day. Um, that hopefully could be enforceable by somebody. Um, <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe there's the ability to do that and still have that be um, something that you can offer um, proposed tenants. But yeah, there's really no um, ability to support something that is not compatible with policy. Dr. Sims. Yeah, I just uh, pulled up sec the section 17.16.250 and just scanned it really quickly. And it, it gives you a lot of room here to do what you need to do without having to turn this commercial. So I support the staff. Mr. Henley? Um, well, I, again, I'm going to echo a lot of things, or I would echo a lot of things that the, my fellow commissioners have said. But um, for me, you know, I like these kind of projects. I mean, you seem to have a pretty clear vision for what you want to do. I think work within the confines of what are there just so it's something that doesn't derail you from doing a great project. I think it's something that there are definitely going to be people who want that type of product. Um, this, Dr. Sims and I were just commenting about how we don't always agree on SPs or we never agree on SPs. But for me, when you have that clear of a vision, um, being able to put that clear, confined picture in front of your community and the council member and this commission, I think, really helps a lot. So. Um, I would just say utilize the tools and, and what are their work with staff. They'll give some great guidance. Um, don't give up on it because I think, again, incremental density, those would be homes for people that need them here in our city. So thank you for what you're doing and how you're imagining the opportunities that are there. Any other comments? I need a motion. I move to accept self recommendation to disapprove. That's a proper motion. A second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, we will move on to historic zoning. Commissioner Johnson, any report? Yes, Chairman. Uh, we did have 170, 176, a second avenue presentation at our last meeting. And this past Tuesday, History Commission met for a special meeting. And History Commission had a little bit of detail from a development team, including our former uh, Commissioner Gobble. And we recommended approval unanimously. So you will hear this project at our next meeting. Great. Real quick parks report. We are uh, having a little controversy out in Warner Parks with some baseball fields. We're going to hear that in November. And then secondarily, Councilman Withers, I appreciate your support of more parkland that was on the agenda tonight. 
I would caution that enthusiasm by the fact that we don't have enough operating dollars to currently maintain our existing parks. So as you continue your term on the council, more money for parks. Uh, executive, executive committee? Nobody's here from the executive oh, committee. Uh, and uh, we, um, director's report, excuse me. Okay, uh, two things. I'm really excited to take a walking tour of East Bank on next Tuesday. So you've got um, instructions in your uh, inbox to meet at the bridge building, wear your walking shoes. I'm really uh, excited to share with you where we are on the East Bank planning work, give you an update, and really show you on the ground some of the conditions that we're grappling with there. Enormous opportunity, also some important uh, challenges that we need to confront. One thing I did want to just acknowledge is um, through that, that project, we have been working really closely with NDOT, which is the new multimodal transportation infrastructure section. And they are really f laser focused on infrastructure investment where we have density. And so I would like to invite the interim director to come to the planning commission and give a presentation on some of the work that she's doing because I do think that, that this is something the commission really grapples with. I think I'm directing this comment to Commissioner Blackshear, but we've all discussed the issue of infrastructure investment that's needed where we're growing. And so I would love to put that on the table. I know that's an important item for the commission. Maybe we'll do it at a work session or here in open sessions. So we're working on it. We've been working hand in glove with them. And I think, I think you'll be pleased with some of the thinking that's going today around a systems approach there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Director. Legislative update. Councilman, any, any news you want to share? Actually, I uh, don't think so. I've got uh, some things that uh, I'm working on with staff that are going to come at the next meeting, and so stay tuned for that. Um, and we will uh, we'll, we'll see how things go. But I'm I'm trying to think if there are any countywide zoning bills or anything like that that folks are proposing. Do you maybe want to mention that we're proposing the district boundaries publicly tomorrow? Oh, that's redistricting. Right. The that's right. Planning yes. Commission. Uh, that's something council will be grappling with uh, in December. That's right. Yeah. So uh, I think the first open house is on Monday. Is that right? And it's here. Yes. I'm and just so. interfering right here with your reporting. No, that, that's that's, uh, that's very important. So for me, as, a, as an outgoing council member, it's less less uh, intense than it is for some of my colleagues who uh, are returning or hope to return. But uh, yeah, but hope that the public comes and participates in that because it's so important. But thank you. All right, I need a motion for dismissal. Adjournment, so moved, we're done. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.